If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Here America's first. Here it goes. Blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah. Sending out good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Sending blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. And then physical things happen in the room that if the communicators facilitate somehow things that can that anybody any scientist would say can't possibly happen and they yeah. actually do happen yeah because i've seen it myself okay guys welcome back to the grime america show uh we're gonna be chatting with friend of the show alex de and leslie keen a little bit later about the whole new york time thing new york times thing of course she was the person who broke that story i think the disclosure story there a while back but first we got uh everybody's favorite podcaster graham i've been podcasting for five years done lot thanks buddy how's it going man good does that that doesn't include my listening time which goes back i said podcast seven when i was listening to alex are you, show, are you skeptical oh, okay i see yeah. where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, man, I'm doing well. Happy five year for you. This is a special episode for that. Yeah, usually we did something, but we just kind of didn't. <laughs> we didn't do the call in show no, no, this no. time. Now nah, we'll do it like at 300 or something. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah. No, I really appreciate 300. Leslie. Uh, Leslie's real um, team player here on this episode. She's a real good sport. Alex pushed her pretty hard about some stuff, and um, that was it was interesting about the. You know, UFO disclosure and the intent uh, behind this drip, drip, and who knows about it. Drip, and, drip, drop. Yeah. So that was a fun it, show. Yeah, it was a great show. A little bit uh, long in the can. We were, you know, it took us a while to release it, but we had to, we just had a trip that we got back from. Actually, we've got to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we'll get Probably into that a, a little bit Probably a transition into that. Do you want to do that now or? Sure. Should I play the jingle? What, ding- what jingle? The synchronicity jingle. Sure, if you want to talk about that. Oh, yeah, we'll do that as well. I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Darren is skeptical about everyone and don't believe it yet. (laughs) Do you want to get into it and I'll rate it? Sure. Cut. Well, no, actually, now you no, you're, you're you more it. familiar with it. No, I'm not. I it, sent well, you the screenshots. You. Oh, my God. Now I have to look up the screenshots? I mean, I wasn't prepared for that. Oh, well, I don't have okay. anything. Okay, anyways, we got uh, a notification on Facebook or something. So we we're in Seaside, Oregon, kind of a little meetup. There was about 18 of us, a little bit, sometimes 20 of us. Um, and uh, we left the place fairly clean, I believe. But anyways, uh, one of the... Uh, I don't know, what should we call the cleaner or like the, the house people, cleaner? The house cleaner. So it turns out the person that cleaned the house was a listener of the show. Yeah. And she's seen Nikki the dude's message on the board. On um, there's a, like a dry erase board there? It was a chalkboard. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Chalkboard. And he wrote the, what did he say? Grimerica Yo Love or something yeah. like that. And then uh, we left a couple of magnets on the fridge. Yeah, I left those magnets on the side of that little toaster oven. Yeah. So she said she went in the first time and seen the just the chalkboard and was like, hey, I listened to that podcast. And then she didn't find the magnets till the second time. Hmm. That's awesome. And yeah. then she was excited. She was like, too bad I didn't know. Would have been a great conversation, which it was all weekend long. Yeah. There's a lot of magic and games and things like that going on too. A little bit of it one <laughs> night. Oh my God. Was it only one night? Yeah, What'd you do the nice. night I wasn't there? Where were you? I left a night early. Oh, that night! Oh, more games. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> we, no. We we, uh, we went to the beach. Sunset, sunset on the beach. There you go. Yeah. Sounds. sounds and I tried to go to bed. Or, I went to bed early. I tried to go to bed by like midnight because I had to get up at five and drive five. twenty hours. Yeah, yeah. sixteen. 
Oh, but then you lose an hour. So the other, uh, so you're going to rate that synchronicity then? I'll give it a nine. Oh, really? 8.42. What are the chances of somebody listening to the show? One in 10,000. One in, ten, no, I thought it was a hundred, one in a hundred thousand. Nah, I was off by a magnitude. Really? Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. You did the calculation? 10,000. One in 10,000? Yeah. And if you take out babies and other people that don't clean houses and throw in our demographics, probably down to like one in 6,000 something. Huh. It's a good job for listening to podcasts, that's for sure. It is pretty, yeah. And I mean, it's just still crazy, the fact that the house cleaner that listens to the podcast, I mean, we don't have that many listeners. We really don't. Yeah. So speaking about great conversations in Seaside, so you didn't, you weren't there for this, right? We were walking around doing a little shopping and stuff. There was probably like eight or eight or nine of us or so, and there was a little sort of wine store with some organic candy and popcorn and stuff like that, like a, like a wine tasting thing it wasn't like a wine store and um <clears throat> they were calling us in we were walking down the street and uh gareth's wife and uh and shameless's wife were, were like uh come, come on you guys got to come in here and listen to this and we go in there and the lady behind the counter is talking about her sasquatch stories right and of course i had magnets and stuff on me and all that and we were talking they were talking about the podcast and a bunch of us guys go in there and and these two ladies there were, were quite amazing. That We had all these discussions on Sasquatch, and so one of them had seen a huge footprint in the mud, like a Sasquatch footprint in the mud. And so we were talking about Sasquatch, and then the other one was talking about missing 411 and how there's a guy who disappeared on the highway the other night, walking from one town to the other. And uh, they're super familiar with all that content. And she had seen a USO, and I was like, a USO? What? Like, let me guess, off the... Island of Catalina. <laughs> She's like, yep, right across the, the water from Catalina, like a star, basically go right into the water. Yeah, crazy stuff. Great conversations. I was handing them out stuff for the podcast, and they were just so excited, like, that they could talk to all these guys about all this cool stuff. Sweet. So, yeah. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, you weren't there. That was the wine shop story? Yeah. That was the... Well, what, what did you expect it to be? I don't know. You guys all played it up. I was expecting it to be something great. Well, it was pretty amazing that you meet a couple of people that are interested in all the same stuff we talk about on the show all the time. Hmm. And everybody was there, like, talking about all that stuff all weekend. That is amazing. you dick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to... I'm... Well, let's... Okay. You that, got a couple new listeners. That'll, anyway. tran that'll transition into, like, the negative comments about our Portland chat. Oh, week. yeah. So no, we got some negative feedback about talking about we got a uh, lot of negative feedback about the homeless situation expected. there and the and the antifa antifa. Um, and we'll address it in an, an upcoming show. We got to do a little bit of research first because I think that uh, you know I want to, and we're going to actually have the guy on who emailed us. We're going to talk about it. He's been living in Portland for a while and he's got some lots of cool projects going on. We're going to talk to him and, but I do want to clarify. I don't want to just say we're. We're wrong because I, you know, I don't know if we, I thought, I thought we did say. It was thought, hearsay. Yeah. I thought you said that, but I don't know what exactly you said was hearsay. I don't Everything's know if that hearsay. was about the. Except the, the shit I, I see. I don't know if it was the poop seen. bridge was hearsay. I don't know. We'll, we'll get into it next week. All right. We'll wait. It's a five year show. We don't want to get tied up in feces. Okay. <laughs> Maybe some of us do. I don't know. No, I don't like that either. No, that's not your thing. No. All right. Well, I do have some, uh. UFO sightings from listeners that I've kind of saved up for the special episode. You know, we don't have a jingle for that. It's kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, you do. Eh? We do have a jingle. Oh, like we, ugh, that one? We kept saying, you know, what is that? What is that? And it wasn't until after the events happened and it disappeared to the south in the darkness that we went inside, we stayed outside for a couple seconds, and we went inside, and she sat on the couch, and I went to the bar, and I sit on a stool, and I took my glasses off, and we stared at each other for 5, 10, 15 minutes, who knows, and I got up, and I wanted to go back outside, and as I grabbed the door, I looked my wife right in the eye, and I said, we just saw our first UFO, and she looked at me back, and she goes, I know. I know. So okay. I know. All right, let's go. Let's go. All right, so this is from Joel. He says, hi, Darren and Graham. Just wanted to reach Joe out. Joe or Joel? Joel. Reach out and say how much I've enjoyed and benefited from listening to the Grimerica show since I discovered it about six months ago. 
I feel like I have remotely connected to a small community of like-minded friends. I also wanted to tell you about a profound sighting I had when I was younger. It was mid-1997. I was with a friend whose parents owned a hobby farm outside of a small town called Gundaru in rural South Wales, New South Wales, Australia. It was about 7.30 to 8 p.m. We were just mooching around, being bored and watching TV when my friend's mom asked us to come into the veranda, onto the veranda and have a look at a strange, brightly flashing triangular object in the night sky. The craft, which hovered on the horizon in the direction of the Brindabella Ranges, had flashing green, red, and white lights with one of these on each corner of the triangle. Jeez, this just sounds like the typical big triangle sighting with the lights on the corner. The object was stationary and visible for close to an hour and was completely silent. It then disappeared. A short while later, the craft reappeared, this time, however, and after being visible for only 15 minutes or so, the triangular craft turned a darkish blood-red color before it appeared to head into space at what can only be described as an, at an unearthly speed. The following morning, as we were headed into town, we heard on the radio that ACT police were inundated with over 2,000 calls from people who also observed strange lights in the previous night sky. To describe what, what we saw as bizarre would be to put it mildly. Thank you, guys. Joel. Thanks, Joel. Yep. That's, that's, wild. Good, that's an interesting sighting. I, you know, just like uh, that other sighting in Australia, big black triangle. Very interesting. Inflatable triangle. So I had the other. Uh... Bingo, bingo, social media jingle. What? Don't forget to rate, comment. Do you have another UFO sighting? I, I did. Yeah, I had. I had. I said, didn't I say I had? Uh, Multiple? I don't know, did you? Yeah, I did, I think. Bingo, bingo. Social gotta read this one, too. Yeah, I gotta read this one, too. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while, Paul. Sorry it took me so long to read your sighting and your experience. Let's see what people think about this. <laughs> I had my first encounter with a UFO when I was 11 years old. I saw the oblong triangle craft hovering above a small grove of trees near my home at the time. I stared for a while and went home. Didn't say anything about it to anyone. I lost time during the event, a couple hours. Ever since then, I had a lump in my shoulder that would hurt every now and again. Didn't think much of it throughout my teen years, but when I was 24 and engaged, I asked my fiancé what it was. I explained... And, and told her jokingly I would cut it out one day. The next day, the lump was gone, like it moved. I got sick for a three-month span. Talking like can't get off the toilet for fear of either, either end overflowing. Oof. After that, I had my second contact through meditation. During this time, I was told that I was marked as an enemy. The entity that spoke to me was an owl. <laughs> I don't know how or why this would be. I'm a peaceful person. The next time you're out and trying to make comp contact, they will give you my answer. That's all I know. This sounds ridiculous, I know, but please, I beg you to help me on this. Give me peace or the ability to make amends. Thank you. Please let me know either on the show or via email. Thanks again. So we've been kind of going back and forth a little bit. Honestly, I, I don't... Um, I don't have any answers. I mean, I don't know. I was hoping for maybe some listeners could bring some light to the subject. I mean, it's, you know, making contact through meditation and stuff is one thing, but missing time through a sighting like that is another. I wouldn't want to just recommend like uh, regression or anything like that. No. He also has a, I think you he think has a podcast. Honestly, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast, but it is called Basket Case Pod. Um, I think I gotta throw that in there. Nice throwing, yeah. But yeah, I hope somebody. I mean, I don't know what kind of advice he's looking for, but what kind of help? But I hope he's. Uh, Hopefully, someone can help him. Yeah, they're gonna help him through you. Email Graham, and he'll introduce you if he can help. That's true. Yeah, I will do that. 
a matchmaker. Yeah, I did talk to him about the owls and how the owls are, um, you know, I'm, they uh, signify ETs a lot, right? Ooh, ooh. I'm not going to play the jingle again, <laughs> but I am going to get into some. I think it's. I feel like it's been a while since we did some social media rundown. Yeah, uh, that's probably true. A few weeks, anyway. We'll scroll down the old YouTubes. Oh boy. We got, love this, so sweet to have your mums on with you guys. Delina, I've always wanted to be friends with a celebrity. My dreams have finally come true. Your biggest fan right here. I don't get that. Very, uh, I think that's one of my mom's friends. Oh, oh, okay. Very nice, boys. Really appreciate hearing from your moms. Seriously, this was a real treat, guys. That's uh, obviously the show that we had our moms on. That was the yeah when in which the one Day, the one remember? that the special one where Darren forgot to record for the first twenty minutes. And then we had, <laughs> yeah, to we had to do back it again. over and try and you know. I was nervous. My mom was here. Yeah, here we go. Thank you so much for coming on the show again, Randall. I love you guys. Some of the top podcast hosts in the business. I'm proud to be a Grammarican. Sick artwork. What do we got else here? Nice of you guys to release this to the non-contributors. Ultimately, it is good for everyone. That was a Randall Carlson show. You guys fucked up, though, for not having wished Randall a happy birthday. Expected from Darren, but Graham, disappointed. Write it down next year. I don't know when Randall's birthday is. Was it really? Great podcast, guys. Best I have heard anywhere in a long time. Liked and shared. Uh, we'll skip past some random ones here. Uh, da -da, time change. We can handle the truth. Great podcast, guy. What guys? What a pleasure to listen to Randall. All fired up. This was the most inspirational I've ever heard him, and I love the fact that he is positive and has a plan. We need more men like Randall Carlson. Fantastic conversation. Keep up the good work. Uh, on, the, on the podcast with Chase, what I'm trying to figure out is, why haven't I heard of this guy before? Thanks, fellas, for introducing me to another fine mind. Nice. Ta -da. Just subscribe to his channel this week. This is on the Jason Louv app. Good info. Oh, that hasn't come out yet. I shouldn't read that one. 288 The Fentons. Well, since nobody else is going to comment, bingo, bango, mofos, a good episode. Thanks. And you subscribers, support the show. Hey, I just... No, I don't want to read that one either. The Grimerica Show, Richard Parker. Ha, ha, ha. Effing hilarious. <laughs> All right, that's probably good for yeah, the social good. media. Fucking social media. You want to cut it now? <laughs> Let's do the support. Sh Let's do the support spiel first. What do you? Don't throw your arms up. Support the We're show. We're supposed to split it in half. Well, what does it have to be half exactly? Now everyone well, knows your game. There's not going to be much to do after. Anyway, support the show, guys. Five years. Um, two hundred and eighty-five. 287, I don't know where we're at, 288 maybe, might even be 289. Um, 289 apps, all free, no ads, no no sponsors, no bullshit. A little bit of grounds bullshit, but we get through it. Um, so do, if you haven't supported the show yet, uh, it's been five years, probably time, could be time. Uh, so go over to grimeamerica.ca slash support today and do sign up for a monthly or do a one-time donation if you can. There's weekly, there's yearly. Um, there's the Patreon, of course, and uh, there's all the stuff in the show notes that you can do that helps out the show that's not, that doesn't cost you any money. Like, if you haven't re reviewed the show in five years, you could probably get on that. Uh, you could probably sign up for the newsletter, then you get alerts for the live shows and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. Um, anything else? I'm oh, and you do get the black budget, too. So that's another, like, I think there's 25 or 26 episodes in there now that you get access to. Yeah, different type of content and yeah, some controversial stuff a little bit. Yeah, some weird stuff gets a little weird sometimes. Not like the normal ones don't get weird. We had so, a game show. And then the other thing is, uh, 
I'm on Instagram. Darren's on Twitter a little bit. Not much anymore, but... Uh, Twitter is fading fast. Yeah. You really should just go to the chats. Yeah. That's, that's, about, that's about the depth of my social media presence these days is popping into the chats. Scryamerica.ca slash chats, of course. And uh, yeah, actually, I'll play the little jingle. Where is that fucking jingle? Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Hello, Mr. Great America Chats. Yoo-hoo! Darren and Graham are going deep. It's a profound UFO quote of the week. Words to ponder and critique. It's a profound UFO quote of the week. All right, I got a few special ones to choose from today because it's, uh, you know, it's important. I'll let you do two. Important episodes. Since it's well, five years, you can okay, do well, they're two. They're from the CIA.gov. Oh, UFO no, no, you're back rating. down to one. You're back down. So I either have, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the titles and you can decide. If you see an identif- unidentified flying object, UFO in brackets, land here, dial CD. And that's a uh, sanitized approved from release, 1964. It's an article written on the CIA government website. Uh, this one's uh, UFOs, a military threat, radio TV reports. And it's a, for the public affairs staff. It's program Dan Rather. I think there was a guy sitting in for Dan Rather, so he talks about something there. And then there's a letter. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a letter from 1957. Are you going to read the letter? Do you want me to? Sure. Okay, I'll do that one. <clears throat> this is, again, from CA.gov. I'll put it... I'll put it... You need a little background music. Get reading. I don't need this is distracting. No, it's distracting to you. It's nice to everybody else. You don't have to hear your mouth noises. Your interesting letter of October 1st was well received and appreciated. Although I cannot completely agree with your feelings on the subject, I nonetheless respect your opinion and wish to thank you for taking the time to answer. And guess what's redacted? All the names, who it's to, who it's from. That's it. Yeah. That's no, no, hang on, hang on. It was refreshing to receive a negative letter that evidenced clear and sound thinking. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same for some seven or eight odd letters from scientists who, although thinking much the same as you, have shown sarcasm and ridicule in expressing themselves. This, I think, is not in line with good scientific thought. Whether or not I can use your opinions in the book remains for the publisher to decide. As I stated in my previous letter, the book's purpose is to present a legitimate case for the UFO. Personally, I would like to include a chapter containing the statements of men like you who believe UFOs are natural phenomena or conventional objects, and in brackets, although it would be a shame to put your statements in with those of men less scientific in their approach. In order to be fair, but I have to, I have reason to think the publisher might find such a, such a chapter detracting to the theme of the book. I hesitate to contact blank for the above reason for my notes i find their opinions negative read the existence of ufos i should say it in my 1950s accent see you see it would interest me to know with what usaf you gangster in 1950 project you're associated with see again my thanks see and best wishes why do you keep saying see yours very truly see <laughs> Are you like a private detective? Are you a private detective or a gangster? <laughs> One of the two? Yeah, see? Yeah. There you go, see? <laughs> Go down on the old man and grab the place, see? <laughs> there you have it. Yeah. What else you got? You got some synchros? Uh, well, I kind of have a uh, another UFO sighting from a fellow in Alberta, close by here. Albertan? Yep. Is it failed? It's been a while. It's been a while. No, it's uh, from Joseph. I always have a hard time when the name doesn't match the name on the UFO signature. It's like people just keep changing that. So, hello, Graham and Darren. I would like to start by saying I love the show and will be contributing to your efforts in as many ways as possible. I have started listening to podcasts about a year ago, and I found your podcast while listening to Expanded Perspectives and really liked your format. Plus, you guys are Canadian like me. 
Even better, you guys are in the same province. Greetings from Edmonton. I will try to keep this email short as I have many experiences to share with you and your audience and I can provide you with more than than what I have included in this meal if you're interested in this email, is if you're interested. Let's see here. I, uh, I don't think I'm going to read that. So he's got two short UFO sightings. I'm going to read the UFO sighting here. The first one was in November 2010. I was walking to work in East Edmonton early in the morning, long before the sun would rise, and I was looking up at the sky as it was perfectly clear. At one point, I noticed two strobe lights from an aer airplane flying very high directly above me from west to east, and for some reason, I was compelled to watch it as it flew away towards the horizon. As it neared the horizon, it approached a thin band of clouds, and I could barely see the strobe lights at, at that distance. Suddenly, I saw something to the right of it. A f in front of the clouds was an orange cigar-shaped object that just appeared in an instant. It was glowing orange like very hot steel. It was completely still horizontally aligned and I estimate that it would have to be enormous because it was near the horizon maybe 0.5 to 2 kilometers long but hard to tell at that distance but as suddenly as it appeared it then disappeared completely and I never saw anything else like it since it's like it powered up to go to warp and suddenly jumped to another dimension or momentarily dropped cloak warp speed baby when's your first little sea seti outing First. Must, must be coming out. Next, been out already this year? No, uh, have I? I don't think I have. No, no, it's been. So your first. First of the year. First yeah, of the year. No, I got to get out there pretty soon. Can you do it by yourself, or you're a little you're not mentally powerful enough? It's better in a group. Is Power it? the group. Yeah. 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 Eight people or That's sixteen. That's a little scary on your own too. If I was to go in that place. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that time you went camping by yourself and you're going to do all this great stuff and you just stayed in the tent the whole time because you're scared. <laughs> That's not why I stayed in the tent the whole time. What do you mean? Uh, what was well, I going to do? All this great stuff. Like, I don't know. You were all excited about I just going said camping that, by yourself. I just said I stayed in the tent when I heard the noises outside. That's yeah. all. And that was kind of scary. Do you think like the I, tent would protect you? Well, that's the problem. It doesn't. Isn't it more you're like, like you're, you're just, like basically just sitting still <laughs> and there's nothing protecting you. Yeah, you can't see. Or, the bear knows there's a thing in the tent. That's why you don't move. You're just sitting there. You don't even want to breathe. You're just hearing noises walking around. Walking around. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You're sniffing? Yeah. So, Brody, are you going to go at sea setting with him? He doesn't know you you summon then UFOs with your mind. Is that fucking go. like that orb searching shit? Yeah, it's a lot well, like not, that. Not really. It's a lot yeah. like that. It's a lot like that? Yeah. No, it's not. Very similar. Quite similar. Yeah, we're going to try it. I got some people lined up for the podcast, too. Kind of related to that. Should be good. Happy five year, bro. We had the new moon, dark sky, which is great. <laughs> had a plan, camping, pitched a tent, went back there for the night. Okay, it's the clear, clear darkest right? night. Pow, pow. So I had to read that meditation, did the singing bowl, and that shit starts happening. Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> we started seeing flash bulbs. <laughs> Streakers coming down. Do you think that's Grim failed singing? Yes. Yeah. The he said it star. Grim Dunlop. Is the he said it star. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's well done, but it's still it's, embarrassing every time I hear it. It's super embarrassing. Yeah. I don't have one like that yet, so I don't feel your pain. You do point at me a lot, though, so we'll call it even. Do you want me to read the public affairs staff memo from the CIA website? Sure. Yeah, hey, November 3, 1981. Oh, God. This That's is, almost my birthday. This is W Top Radio CBS Network, Washington, D.C., Dan Rather, <clears throat> Bob Schieffer. So that'd be three eleven eighty one. Uh yeah. And I was born on ten three. Hmm. This is Bob Schaefer sitting in for Dan Rather and reporting with news and commentary on the CBS radio network. When the space shuttle shoots into outer space tomorrow, it will not be alone. It will enter a region inhabited by satellites and stars and space litter and UFOs. That last part, the part about UFOs, is the assumption of a group for which some time has been bringing suit against the government to force it to open its UFO files. The group was successful in 1979 when the CIA released 900 UFO-related documents. Now they are going for the files of the National Security Agency, a handful of files which they believe contains tantalizing information like a report tantalizing no it's tantalizing tantalizing yeah so good you get a tattoo 
like a report on the UFO which supposedly shot down a Russian MiG over Cuba a few years ago. The latest suit is being brought on by a New York attorney who says UFOs aren't happy little spaceships carrying creatures of benign intent. UFOs, he says, are a real military threat. We'll have the UFO suit in a moment. And then Schaefer, Peter Griston is a lawyer. Are you reading? Bronx. Sounds like you're reading like the screenplay for the fucking nightly news on CBS. That's what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Totally. probably feels a lot like that. He's a lawyer in the Bronx and the director of a small group of concerned. Oh, that concerned they didn't say. So I better just not put that in there. Called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy or Cause. In 1977, the group sued under the Freedom of Information Act to force the CIA to publish its UFO files. Two years later, the CIA released 900 pages of documents. But during its search of the files, the agency found some material that originated with the NSA. It turned these papers over to the NSA. Why would it do that? Gersten and Cause filed the suit to get them to. So there you go. To where? Also. Ah, as well. Yeah. Hmm. As well, they say in, in Alberta, they say as well, but not in BC. They say too? They say, yeah, they do. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, well, fuck them. I came here and everybody's like, you as well. I'm like, oh, that's weird. It's polite. Usually it's you too. You too. You too sucks. <laughs> and I still can't delete them off my fucking iPhone. Really? It's oh. impossible to delete the fucking you, shitty you? U2 album off my phone. That free really? album that they made you Yeah, download? you can't get it off your phone. <laughs> you can't delete it. I tried several times. That's funny because I have the opposite problem where I put stuff on my phone and, they, and I can't get it get it back it deletes itself <laughs> no i'm serious like yeah. then i've got a bunch of stuff on my computer that used to be on my phone and somehow it's not there are anymore. you still dealing with that oh. itunes problem pretty like much four years pretty ago? much it's yeah. always an issue i go to listen to something not available at this moment how is it not available i didn't my shit works i didn't turn it off except the i can't phone. get rid of the u2 album i think there's something there's weird a whole bunch on. of meditations like and I don't Monroe Institute trust meditations that are not there anymore so who are we chatting with this week? Les Leslie and Alex? Yeah. This one's a little out of off. Yeah, we should probably just <clears throat> reel it back in a little bit. This is an important episode. Leslie's done a lot of great work. She uh she's responsible for that the New York Times, that disclosure article, working on that with those those guys and her book, The UFOs Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials, on the record is an amazing book. And we also talk a little bit about um the The what? Spit it out, man. Surviving death. Oh, right. Just surviving death. I forgot we got into that uh, life after death stuff yeah. after that. That's yeah, yeah. a great app. You guys should enjoy it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Happy five years, dude. Happy five years, Thanks, motherfucker. Dude. Support the show, guys. And uh, review the show. Do all the stuff you've been meaning to do for the last five years. All right, we've got a very special episode tonight. We've got Alex Sakaris from Skeptico. You all know him. He's he's co help special co-host tonight, helping us out. And we've got the one and only Leslie Kane on, and she wrote 
a, a groundbreaking book, I think, uh, back probably eight or ten years ago now, uh, UFOs, general pilots, and government officials go on the record. And this is this was kind of my go-to book for people that really didn't get this phenomena that I would hand to them and say, read this book if you don't think there's anything to this. Is because it on the that shelf? was like the definitive book. It probably is on our bookshelf. It better be. That's right. Anyways, it, this That's was... It? this was <laughs> There it is. Oh, yeah, that's on there. And we're also going to talk a little bit about Leslie's latest book, Surviving Death. The journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife. And, of course, we're going to, we're going to talk, touch on, um, you know, the sort of disclosure aspect. And Leslie was responsible for breaking the story in the New York Times in December about the, uh, the DOD and their, and their um, program to investigate flying saucers and UFOs. So welcome to the show, Leslie. Thanks so much for your time. It's great to be here, Graham. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, I think a lot of people have heard, sort of heard the story about the, um, you know, the article, and it's interesting looking back over, over four months. But I think for a lot of our listeners that aren't too familiar with the details, maybe you should just go back and explain the process of how, how this, uh, how you got this story into the New York New York Times. Okay. Do you want me to? Ex- well, what happened was before I tell you what the story actually is. Um, I was invited to a meeting in Washington in October. I I think it was, I forget the exact date, early October, um, to meet this person named Lou Elizondo, who was uh, the head of a government program within the DOD that nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. And I was actually invited by some of his colleagues who I had known because I, two of them I had known for a long time, um, uh, to come down to this meeting in Washington. And and it was just blew my mind because... uh, we spent about three or four hours in this hotel, and I was shown all this really interesting stuff um, uh, that had to do with verifying the existence of the program and the involvement of Harry Reid in the program and the videos and lots of stuff about Elizondo and his career and his credentials, and I got to interview him for a long time. And uh, that's how it all started. I mean, basically, um, I think his colleagues felt, you know, he was just willing to go along, but it was mainly his colleagues who initiated this and felt like this information should be made public and that the best place for it to happen was the New York Times. And because I have a colleague uh, named Ralph Blumenthal, who I've worked with for quite a few years, um, who is associated with, he's actually a freelance journalist for the Times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, That was my my avenue to try to get it to the Times. And so um, Ralph is somebody who's been interested in the UFO issue for a long time. Right. And we've actually co-written some articles together before for the Huffington Post. And we've also pitched other things to the Times, which they didn't go for in the past. Um, and so we, Ralph made a pitch. I explained the whole thing to him. I brought him, he had an other meetings with Elizondo so he could be brought in on it. It was a long process. And then we pitched it to the Times and it went up very various uh, hierarchical chains of command at the Times and everything. And they they decided to do the story. So they uh, they also uh, they gave us this wonderful female journalist named Helene Cooper, who is one of their best reporters. Her specialty is the Department of Defense, and she's out of the Washington office. So she was the perfect person to take the story on. And we just that's how it all happened. And basically, what the story was was just breaking the news that there is this program and explaining how it was funded, how it was set up, who was involved with it, a little bit about what it had determined and why it was important and just to sort of lay it out because we never knew before that there was a government program. It was all up to speculation until that point. Was it, was it, what was it like for you personally? Because you, I mean, in your, in your UFO book from a few years previous, you actually suggested that there'd be a government there should be a government program investigating this stuff, right? But obviously one with transparency and, and openness right. and efficiency and all that. So what was it like for you all of a sudden getting this handed to you almost like almost put in your lap, like here, you know, help us, help us get this information out. I mean, was it, did you have any skeptical notions at all about what, you know, why is this coming out now or what's going on with this? No, I mean, that's what a lot of the UFO people seem to have all these sort of, you know, complicated analyses of the whole thing. <laughs> no, the reason it happened then was because that was when Elizondo decided to come forward. Right. Right. He decided he was frustrated enough with the inefficiency of the program, with the lack of respect, with the lack of funding, the whole bit. And he was just had it 
And so he was just ready to leave. And that's what precipitated the story. If he hadn't left at that particular moment, it would have happened some other time when he, if he left later. Yeah. I think Alex uh, wants to say something. I, I, I got to jump in here. I got to jump here in here to defend all the, the UFO people on the sideline in the community who are skeptical. I mean, Leslie, who comes forward? This is not a day. He, he's not a whistleblower, right? This is yeah, he kind Ed's, of is. He no, kind of is. This isn't Ed Snowden. This isn't no. WikiLeaks. This is a guy you met him at DOD. DOD fed the story out. So, I mean, doesn't and, that put a different angle no, on DOD it? DOD didn't feed the story out, Alex. They were furious that the story came out at the DOD. They didn't want it to come out. What, it, I mean, you are such a good journalist, writer investigative journalist beyond, you know, 10 well, times I have this group colleagues, here. Two but, colleagues at the Times that have, are even more experienced than I am that were in, in on this with me. So but not just, just me. looking at it from a, from the big picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is an example, where is an example of a, where anyone inside the government has come out and said anything even like this? I mean, the, the kid who went to jail for having a picture of a submarine in his background. I mean, this is not a day and age where people inside the government with deep state secrets like this are allowed to speak freely. So we okay, can well, here's assume that he, that he was not breaking boundaries or saying all this crazy stuff that no one wanted him to say. This is a controlled release. No, I don't agree with that. I mean, none of our work ever led me to get to that conclusion or any of us. And we talked to a lot of people, a lot of people, including hours and hours and hours with Elizondo. The point is none of the information that he brought forward was classified information. So he's not like a Snowden or a WikiLeaks who's really breaking the law. And he's not really a whistleblower in that sense, because there's nothing really uh, against the law or nothing that he shouldn't. I mean, there's nothing telling him not to say this. Right. So is it just not classified? Yeah. Is it just but, because it's the times then? Is that why it's such a big deal? Because I mean, if there's nothing classified, then what's the big deal? Because it was a big deal to know as a fact that there has been a program within the D Department of Defense since 2007 that nobody knew about and that has been taking seriously UFOs and was funded, you know, with $22 million for a number of years and continued to investigate UFOs after that. And yet, even though they did their work, mm -hmm. they couldn't be very efficient about it. And that's what was frustrating for him. He was one person who came out on his own, much to the consternation of the Department of Defense. Now, if you oh, believe bye. otherwise, Alex, you're going to have to show me evidence of that. I, th I think the evidence of that is is it's self-evident. You know, you, so you go to the I New York Times. Well, I don't agree. I have you, seen you, no evidence and neither have my colleagues that there was some kind of, I don't even know what you're exactly saying that he well, was, there was finish. some kind of orchestrated well, I, I, plan. Well, I think he, look, I think in the finish. least, I think in the least he's saying that th there needs to be some sort of approval for somebody to, to talk about this kind of stuff. I mean, even with the, to the stars, the, to the stars Academy, like there's ex CIA yeah. and ex skunk works people in there that obviously have to have some, I would think they'd have to have some, some approval to talk about this stuff and to, to, to bring this forward. I mean, Right. Once you're so in, let me let me jump in there because I, the I just interviewed. Is, is about classified information. That's the distinction. Right. That there, there is that that distinction is, is meaningless at this point. This is the biggest story probably in in the in our in the history of our lives. Certainly, a lot of people are saying in the history of the world. And to suggest that this somehow and some phony baloney classified, not classified, top secret clear, uh, classification. This isn't classified, and that's supposed to be the 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 mark. I I don't see it. You know, I just interviewed Colonel John Alexander, who you know, and mm -hmm. I just interviewed him recently, right? Because John Alexander, we all know, has always been the guy who stood up at these <laughs> UFO conferences and said, "I was at the highest levels. Right. I talked to all the people." There if was no government know, program, yeah. right? So, yeah. what do you think he said when I said, "Okay, well, now he goes." Well, I guess I was wrong, but there still really isn't a program. This it's the same crap. So I, I think you know part of the reaction that came from this story was number one, it's it's kind of preposterous to suggest that this somehow isn't classified. I would I would then ask who is deciding what's classified not, and isn't classified. But the second wait part, a minute, is Alex, just, just before you go on, I'm not suggesting that this is classified or not. I'm telling you the facts that nothing that Elizondo has conveyed is classified. 
The name of the program is not classified. The information he has brought forward is not classified. The videos aren't classified. He's very, very careful about that. He will never reveal anything that's classified. So I would for, suggest that that's more evidence of a controlled release than anything else, because on, from, from our level, from the people on the outside looking in, why would this not be classified? Under what criteria would this somehow not deserve classification, given well, all the other crazy stuff that is classified? Well, Alex, I am a lot kind of on the, the outside oh, looking You want me to in. respond to that? A lot, of the, a lot of the program data is classified. The only stuff that he has provided is the parts that aren't. Right. And that's why the videos, you only see short excerpts of those videos. You know, people wonder what happened before and after, right? Why is it just this three seconds or whatever it is, eight second clip? Mm -hmm. It's because the parts before and after that contain sensitive information that is classified. They had to very carefully excerpt part of it that doesn't reveal anything such as sources and methods or equipment or whatever kind of data that they're not allowed to reveal. And, you know, this is this is the way it happened. I mean, the name of the program is very secretive. And it was, in fact, Elizondo made it a point. He tried his best when he started to work on the program not to try to keep it unclassified as best he could. It was that he had a way of burying it mm. within the system without classifying it. And that was actually something he wanted to do. And at least the existence of the program, the name of the program even though some of the case data is definitely classified. That's interesting. And I mean, so he went, he went about that from the beginning to maybe in hopes that one day he would be able to, to, to use, you know, to do that, right. To have, yeah. Or he know. just didn't see any need to classify it. And I guess, you know, he preferred not to, I mean, I don't know exactly the reasons why, but fortunately that was the case so that he, when he came forward, there was a certain amount that he could talk about. But he took a big risk. I mean, for instance, the, the resignation letter that he wrote, this was written personally to the Secretary of Defense, who's a good friend of, of his. For him to provide, for, we, he didn't actually provide that, but I was given that, you know, we were given that document. That was a really big deal to be have that document provided to us. Um, and even though he, you know, there was, there was nothing classified in that letter, there was no laws being broken by somebody leaking that letter to us, but mm -hmm. it was still a really big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was, and you know, I just don't agree that this is some kind of controlled and orchestrated operation. Um, people can have their opinions about it, but I need something, I need data to show me that that's the case. And I probably, we have probably dug into this more than anybody else. And I think we're in a good position to know whether that's the case or not. We have not found any evidence of that. So can you give me that's a, all i can say can i might you, be wrong but that's all i can say can you give me a quick background on on alessandro yeah i mean he was originally he was asked to come in the program in 2008 because the original head of the program was getting it had, had a very very difficult time uh there was a lot of opposition to the program and they they really made his life difficult and he was asked to, to take over and basically sort of run it uh, and he did um, and he had, I, you know, he has a very, very, I mean, he has his performance evaluations are incredibly high. He had outstanding reviews every year and he was involved with a lot of very sensitive stuff, uh, you know, uh, very, very high level special access programs. And he was a counterintelligence official and he was out in the field a lot and he had a very, a broad range of responsibilities. This program was just a small part of what he did. Mm -hmm. And after the funding stopped in 2012, it became even smaller. And basically the people who were dedicated to this just kept on doing it without any budget for it, really. I mean, they just kept on doing whatever they could, but it wasn't the major thing that he was doing. He had a lot of other very uh, high-level responsibilities. So the budget um, was about th he was, three he was or very four. Highly, what's, he was very well respected within the DOD, as I said, and his very, very high ratings for all the work that he did. So the budget was about three, four million a year. You know the what they were doing with that? Million, the budget was tiny. It was twenty-two million dollars over two years, I believe it was twenty. Oh, that's a uh, more, yeah. Yeah. Well, that and basically that went to the big old airspace. You know, that was a contractor who hired out all these scientists and all these other people to do a lot of investigations, and but it only lasted a short time, and then they they kind of narrowed the scope of the operation to just taking military and intelligence cases that involved UFOs, whereas before that it was broader because Bigelow was into, had the ranch and he was interested in a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, they they really narrowed it down more. And agent, you know, intelligence agencies and the Navy and other agencies would bring them cases within the the ATIP program, and then they would work. They cooperate with the other agencies to investigate the cases, and that went on for you know until still going on today, actually. Mm. You know, Leslie, if I can jump in there one more time, I think another reason why folks are very skeptical of this story, of the origins of this story, not the content. I think everyone's on board with this is real. But the way the story has come about, the other thing is The New York Times, of course. I mean, it's it's awesome. And I have no doubt in terms of the way that you're telling it with inside The New York Times and how it operated and their uh, careful and measured approach and moving it through the thing. But the New York Times, I mean, where was the New York Times with with a 12 part investigative series on your book? Your book had has incredibly uh, authoritative, trusted voices in it. The New York Times was nowhere near that story. Where was the New York Times with uh, with the disclosure project, the congressional like disclosure project? Again, dozens and dozens of highly credible, highly uh, credentialed people inside inside the deep state. The New York Times was nowhere to be found. So I don't think it really rings true to say, well, they were never given, they were never given a shot at it. It's like, no, go, I did this before the show, before this show. You go Google New York Times UFO. The last mm-hmm. 10 years, there's nothing. And now December, it 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 all, all opens up. And of course, the sea has closed, right? Well, and not, they didn't really do a follow-up story no, and, on it either. And to add to that, it's the timing which is suspect as well, because Podesta and Hillary were supposed to be the disclosure. A lot of people were hanging the disclosure hat on them, as you know. And then when Hillary lost and Trump's in, the timing seems suspect. That all of a sudden they, now, they hung it on themselves. now they're paying attention to the UFO thing. And I know there's not a lot of. I can't cite a lot of evidence for that, but I think that's just building on the reason why some of the community just just doesn't doesn't trust it or not doesn't trust it, but is skeptical of the of the origins. I mean, for one, finally after decades and decades, they're admitting this. You know, I mean, it's great on on one hand. I mean, I'm, I think it's fantastic, and it has been. I mean, I'd like to let let you comment on that before I ask <laughs> you ask you more about the disclosure <laughs> aspect. Comment now. What specifically? I mean, I mean, in terms of what Alex was saying, uh, I don't think there's ever been a story like this that has been brought to the New York Times as something brand new, exclusive, just for them. Yeah. The disclosure project. If you're talking about Stephen Greer's press conference, that was all over the map. Everybody covered it, and yeah. it was over. Even the New York Times. I have. They did one little article on it. And then uh, my book. I mean, it's all in my book. They only want stuff at the New York Times that's brand new and exclusive for them. That's breaking news. That's different. They're not going to just repeat something that's already out there. But this wasn't exclusive. Elizondo, it certainly was. Well, Elizondo it was absolutely been all exclusive. over the place. Yeah, no, but, that's but not then true. he went to C- play play the clip. I mean, he went to CBS, the afterwards. Washington Post. Yes, afterwards. afterwards. Like, afterwards. doesn't make any difference. Exclusive. But, I mean, that the Times broke the story and had the exclusive story, and then everybody else jumps on afterwards. But that's what it means to have an ex- exclusive that the you break story, it. The, the biggest story in 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 history, right? It, it it should have been if it's if it's real in that way, or if it caught the traction they wanted to. Where's the twelve part series? But then he just goes and makes the rounds. I mean, it's like a guy coming out with a new book. He goes on CBS. He finally that's, makes it on the Fox. True. Play the thing from a. Uh, Tucker Carlson, I thought, probably did the 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 best I job. Agree with you. Of kind Tucker of Carlson it was up. great. Okay, I agree well, with you. So yes, I mean, Elizondo graciously, much to his dis, he didn't like it. He didn't want to go on the media. He'd never done it before. He was very nervous. He took. He was coached, and he did it. He did this following the release of the article. But the important thing was the release of the New York Times article. And yes, the media went bananas afterwards. And yes, he was willing to be interviewed about it. I don't really I, understand the point you're making. Well, I, I, I think you, you do. You just have a different opinion, which is fair. But I'll make a different point that's related. You, uh-huh. You've been in this field. So you certainly understand the other hesitancy people have, given the amount of misinformation, disinformation, criminal activity, coercion, uh, intimidation that's going on with the release of this information. I mean, a Paul Benowitz kind of thing where they admit, yeah, we drove the guy crazy. I mean, they admit that stuff, but there's tons of other people that have come and said, hey, I was threatened. My family was threatened. All the rest of this stuff. 
the, the, they've kept such a tight lid on this information to juxtapose that with this release just sends a lot of people reeling like and then to say, well, this one wasn't classified. And, you know, somehow there's it just doesn't ring true to me and to a lot of other people. There's some other story here. You're not responsible for that story. You're responsible for telling your story and you've done a fantastic job with it. And it's kind of in sync with the way you've done your book, kind of cautious, but built on solid rock, which is what we need. But I think you understand why people would be, you know, a little bit leery of the deep states out there muscling and bullying people. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh no, here, come to the trough and eat. Well, I was actually going to, I was going to ask if there's any, like, it's got to be, how frustrating is it that, you know, if it happens in the times 20 years ago, it's like, you might as well just put it in a fucking textbook, but it just happens to come out at the time in the times in a period in history when, you know, half the the country just, half the country just immediately dismisses it. I mean, there's got to be some sort of weird irony to that as well. I mean, it's just like, I mean, honestly, most of the people, most of the people I'm talking to these days aren't, aren't buying things that are on the cover of the New York Times or in the time, you know, they're, they're double checking that and, and they're not, it doesn't have any more credence, I don't think these days than, than, than some of the other places that are running other UFO stories, like compared to maybe what it did 10 years, even 10 years ago. You mean that you're saying that you don't the think Times the New York itself, Times yeah, the has Times the same itself. credibility? No. I don't know. I can't comment on that. As far as I'm concerned, if I could choose one paper where I would like to write a story, it would be the New York Times. That's my paper of choice. But, yeah. you know, I, I, re- I respect anybody's opinion about that. I mean. Yeah, you know. I mean, but it has had a pretty big impact in some ways. But in some other ways, like I'd, I'd really like to explore what you maybe expected and what other people that you were working with expected to happen, because some people are now looking back and saying, this was disclosure, disclosure happened. And I mean, you could even go back and say your book was a part of that because, you know, you had people on the record in your book and that was kind of like a little drip or whatever. And, and now this, this comes out and people, some people are saying it's disclosure. And I've had friends of mine that know that I'm interested in, in UFOs and I have been for, for decades and they've, uh-huh. I've been able to talk to them about it, but after that article came out, they were like, okay, now I believe. So it had an effect on all those people that were maybe sitting on the fence or all those people that, you know, were open-minded to it, but not really, they would never really dig into it to find the evidence themselves. So it has had a mm-hmm. pretty big effect. And four months down the road now, what, what do you, like, what did you expect and how did it turn out for you now looking back four months and, and did, you know, was that, are we going to look back in 10 years and say this was the point where a disclosure kind of happened or? I mean, first of all, when you say disclosure, maybe you could define what you mean by that. Acknowledgement of the mystery. That's the way I, mean I, a, I think a, of it as some sort official of official or acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. And not that I need you know, that, that personally, because I don't really care if the government does yeah. or not. I'd rather have the scientific community and, and, and others ac- accept it. Well, I think it's all of those. Doesn't it have to be all of those to be real disclosure? Well, a lot of people think about it as the government. I mean, for some reason, it's a, it's a you know, the disclosure is kind of wrapped around the government telling us that there's something there. Oh, man, that is a bad sign of the times. <laughs> so, so Yeah, I mean, that word is used all the time. So that's why when you say, do I think this is a disclosure i have to know exactly what yeah. you mean no, by the good, word yeah. disclosure yeah that's a good question do you say okay so what you're saying is huh as, as i could Sorry. layman that for you because i'm kind of a layman in the ufo field uh, he's a bit more on the to, outside compared to everyone in this conversation is like uh you know when i'm telling my grandkids about alien why how when we first started figuring out there was people from other planets is this going to be looked at as any sort of tipping point or any sort of would this be anywhere on the benchmark in history where this is you know this is where it started to break the, this was the crack I mean, in the levee sorry it's hard to say until more time has passed i mean we could i certainly hope so and i think it was a really big step yeah because we know, you know, we, I mean, it's simple. We no longer have to speculate whether there was a go- is a government program or not. We now know that there is. Um, and it also establishes that there's a, something real about the phenomenon. As, like you were saying, a lot of people just sort of who couldn't accept it before, if they see that the government's been studying this thing for 10 years, or the D- Department of Defense, they're going to recognize that there must be something to it or they wouldn't waste their time. 
it just sort of elevates it like that. But um, so I think it's hard to say what will happen in the future and how it, how it will be seen in terms of the progression of things. But um, I hopefully I know that there are going to be more doors that are going to open. It just takes time. What, you that's can... the problem. And people are very anxious for more and more and more right oh, away. Yeah, for sure. And there are things happening behind the scenes that are really, really positive, but they're not things that can be made public because they would completely be derailed if that happened. Yeah. And eventually, I think we're going to see more really positive developments happening. Positive develop. What, what do what do we you mean now? Now I'm going to grill you the way you were grilling us. What, what, <laughs> I don't positive mean to be in, positive you. in positive in what way? Yeah. Well, I mean Baby. in the way that your your co-hosts were just mentioning, and what they call disclosure. And I'll put that in quotes. I mean, this may be a step in that in quite some kind of official acknowledgement. I'm just saying I think there's going to be more and there's going to be more support for, for this kind of uh, investigations to happen. Well, because, I'd like to, because I got to tell you, whoa, 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 can wait, I just share? Wait, no, no, go no, ahead, no, I'm no, sorry. no. I got a yeah, question yeah. for yeah. Alex. I'm going to roll it back to Alex because obviously Alex feels that, and then I'm going to ask Graham the same question, but Alex already feels like we've passed that sort of point in history that we're going to look back on. So I'll ask, I'll ask Alex and Graham the same question. Alex, when was that point in history that we're going to look back on and say this is that point in history where, you know, it started? Because obviously well, both of you think we've passed it, I think, right? Well, I, I guess I'm going to answer that with the same little anecdote that I was going to say before. It's the soccer dad story. So I'm out watching my daughter's high school soccer game. And kind of like your story, this guy comes walking over to me because he knows I'm interested in this stuff, you know, <laughs> exactly. in general. Right. Yeah. And right. he says... Hey, you know what? Now listen to his spin on it. He goes, I can't believe I saw this story on UFOs in the New York Times. And then it just went away. What's up with that? Why did it go away? <laughs> that was his take unprompted. I didn't say anything. So then I went through the whole thing and I said, well, you know, there's kind of a lot to it. And, you know, you might want to look at this and you might want to look at this guy right from San Diego here from Blink-182 and how he's come out and he was fed all this information and all the rest of this. And he's pushing now through his organization, the whole thing. And his head was just spinning. But the point is, is twofold. One, what people picked up on is that one, this is the biggest story in history, but everyone kept sitting around waiting for the fallout. And when it didn't it. Yeah. happen, everyone was like, what the heck just happened? So I, I guess I'd throw that back to you, Leslie. What the heck just happened? Because I'll give you the conspiratorial version of what happened. Is uh -huh. they were trying to do something. They were trying to run some kind of program. Not that the information wasn't true. Not that you got duped. Not that the video isn't real. It's all real. But the way that it came out had a certain intended purpose. And maybe that intended purpose didn't quite work out the way they anticipated. And now there's some kind of repositioning, what do we do next kind of thing. So rip that apart. That's a crazy conspiracy idea. But why the real part of it is, why didn't this take off? Why didn't this happen? This is the biggest story in history. Why didn't it happen in a bigger way? Well, or what you're saying is, why hasn't there been more stories that have followed, right? I mean, it's, no, it's, from no. my position, there that's my own, my only interest is to try to do more stories. Well, well but, but hold on. No, that's no, not No, no, I, I think you he's know, look, talking about people, like, you know, now that this comes out, you think there'd be a lot yeah. more digging into actual cases and going back, and there'd be more oh, of an overarching yeah. story about UFOs. Oh, I mean, exactly. Well, that has to do ago, with two other years reporting, ago, we were yes. all talking. Two years ago, when we were all talking about disclosure, and you listened to Gramerica, and you listened to, like, their interview with Richard Dolan, right? And he wrote the book, After Disclosure, and all that. And he's pretty well-respected in the research uh, UFO research community. What the whole point of that book was, hey, as soon as there's disclosure, the questions will not stop. There will be, well, what about this? What about back in the 1950s when this came out and this happened? What about this one? What about that one? Where were these? There was... And all that made sense to all of us. We all said, yeah, that's probably why there will never be disclosure. Because once they disclose, the questions from the investigative media will not end. All that was completely wrong. None of that happened. There's been zero interest slash follow-up from the people we rely on to 
do well, that. And there's a question there. Why did that? Why is that going on? Well, well yeah, how mean, much of that is because the the main, it seems to me like a lot of the leading experts today have abandoned nuts and bolts. So, I mean, you've got a whole half of the UFO community now that's kind of doesn't think, I, the, my opinion is that doesn't think the government has any better of a handle on it than Grant Cameron does. Or Leslie. Right. I mean, I'm Kane. not, I'm not, I have, you know, I have to tell you, I'm not part of the UFO community and I don't follow everything that they're dealing with online. So I'm not, uh, Alex probably knows more about what they're all saying <laughs> than I do. But, um, you know, there's just so much you guys are saying. Um, in terms of follow up, we, um, you know, every journalist out there, including Politico, The Washington Post, we all want to do more stories on this. And we're all working on it. But so far, we don't have the material we need to do another story and to, to satisfy the editors at The New York Times. Right. But we are in the process of digging into stuff with the hopes of doing that and the intention of doing that. And I think there are other journalists out there doing that too, but the serious media does not just sort of flow out, throw stuff out right and left. They wait until they have something really big and solid well, to report on. Unless and that's it's what we're in the process well, of doing. Come on, unless it's political stuff about Trump. I mean, they're sure quick to throw all kinds of stuff out there politically. Oh yeah. You know, I'm talking about UFO specifically. Yeah. I'm talking about the follow up to the story. Yeah. I mean, there so far has not been a whole, the, the issue, one of the issues that we're facing at the times, you know, and I, I can only say, you know, I, I, I just have to be careful that, about what I say because I, I want to be responsible to the team there and everything. Um, so much of what we wanted to write about, we have found out is classified. And we, we had a sense that there might be more that we could do sooner. Mm -hmm. But we've come up against various walls um, because uh, there's a lot of sense of the, the reactions within the department are very strong. That you know they, they didn't want this to happen. Uh, there's information that cannot be accessed because uh, there's nobody to bring it forward. They have to feel comfortable and confident to, to leak to bring stuff out. Um, and a lot of what what we really wanted to reveal, which is things like more cases from the department, conclusions from the program. Data. What did they determine? How did they go about studying it? A lot of this stuff is just um, classified. We yeah. just can't get access to it, and so that's a problem. Well, I mean, uh, and it, I guess uh, you know we didn't anticipate that that would be as difficult as it's turned out to be. That that element of it. Well, I see what you mean about about needing that fresh stuff for the New York Times, but there's plenty right. of decades of stuff. I mean, your book is another prime example. I mean, they. Just because you're waiting for fresh stuff, they could be exposing all kinds of great cases from the past. I mean, but, yeah, but they're not in, they're just they're not going to do that. I mean, the well, Times know, has that's, so much. That's probably another reason why people the are stories skeptical. that are competing for space in that paper. Yeah. And they're not going to yeah. they're not going to tell some UFO story about some case that's already been published, you know, that happened 30 years ago. That's just that's well, not what want, the New York Times does. I know. But if they wanted their ratings, Listen, they Stormy probably Daniels. should do that because they probably get the best ratings out of it. That's what brings well, us back to that skeptical conspiratorial angle as well. Where is all this backup happening and why, and why not? I mean, they're not going to they just that's just not the way they operate. Operate, but if people think they should, readers can write them letters and say, "Hey, we want to hear more about UFO cases that yeah. happened 30 years ago." But yeah. it's just, they're not going to—they're yeah. not going to do it. I mean, I can't—I have no control over that. I wish they would. So, did, so what was the what but, was uh, so now four months later? How do you feel about like the reaction and the uh, and the the results of that? I mean, did you think of it as as big of a story as it was? Like, was it was it you know was it bigger than you thought or smaller than you thought? Give us a sense of that. I thought it would be pretty big, I, you know, but I, 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 we were so focused on just doing it. And it, there was a lot of editing that we had to deal with and a lot of different layers of people that the times that had to approve it. And that we had to fight for certain things to keep in the story that, the, you know, there was just a lot of back and forth. We we're so focused on that. And then the, the day that it came out, it was really tense because we knew that our competitors were trying to beat us to the finish line there. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time ahead of time to really think about what I expected, but I knew it would be a really big deal. You, Absolutely. But think I, I think the, the response that we had in the week and the week, couple of weeks following was really huge. I mean, I guess I was amazed and sort of not amazed at the same time yeah, because yeah, I think it's yeah. a really big story Yeah, and I knew it would have a big effect. Um, Did you equate then, it you to know, disclosure? Did you equate it to disclosure at all? Or? I mean, I don't, I don't think in those terms. I don't use that yeah. word. I don't like that word. I sort of feel like it's 
you know, it reminds me of sort of, you know, the sort of conspiratorial kind of. <laughs> yeah. What's your personal that, opinion? You know, some of these people will talk as if everybody in the government knows about UFOs and they're all hiding it, you know, and it's just not the case. And most people in government don't know anything about it. So, but, but yes, in terms of official acknowledgement or what some people have called confirmation, yeah. I don't know. Some people say like, that's what, that's what Bigelow likes to say. Yeah. He likes, thinks of it as not so much disclosure because there's already enough information that's been released through the Freedom of Information Act to establish the re reality of this phenomena, of this phenomenon, right? There's already, in a sense, disclosure has already happened in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I think he, some people talk more about confirmation. I don't know, but yeah. this was definitely, I mean, what this was, was basically just <laughs> blowing the whistle on a secret government program that was no longer secret because it was exposed. And because there was so much documentation to prove that it existed, the government had to acknowledge it. I'll tell you what I've noticed a big difference on, and I'd like to know what Alex thinks about this as well, but there has been a shift from what I've seen on other other stories that have come out from other pilots seeing things. There's a couple, like one in Phoenix and one somewhere else, that, that are actually, it's actually being taken a little bit more serious. Like from, in the past, you know, a couple of years, every time you see a story, a headline come out, it's... Sometimes it's already been, it's a story that's already been debunked or it's just sort of a bullshit story or they're making fun of it or there's a little bit of ridicule there. And it, it seems to me like this right. has sort of kicked, kicked things off and given maybe a little bit of authority to other papers and other journalists that actually it's okay to cover this seriously now. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it's probably the case. Yeah, I remember the, the, the thing in Phoenix. I mean, you know, yeah, I think it's true. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. I mean, and so, I mean, there, I do feel like it, it can snowball a little bit from here, even outside of, you know, the New York times and, and, and other, you know, wall street journal, other reputable things. It, it, it gives other, other people the ability to do that without playing the X-Files music in the background. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I hope that's the case. I think that that element of it has gotten better. The yeah. sort of x filey, you know, let's do you guys, do you guys want to play the, the, uh, the Tucker Carlson clips. I thought those were 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 kind of relevant to yep, what we're bet. talking about. Okay, so these are guys who fly for run. a living, who know what Sorry. other airplanes look like, including those maintained by foreign governments, and they're totally shocked by this. This is one among many incidents like it, including many that have happened in the middle of the day to sober people. Lots of independent witnesses at the same event: in commercial pilots, military pilots, O'Hare Airport in the afternoon. None of them have obvious explanations. These are aircraft, apparently, that are moving in ways that appear to violate physics, that are flying very differently from any aircraft ever observed, and way faster than any plane that we know any foreign country has. What is this? Well, we don't know, because for some reason, the Defense Department is not interested in finding out. Ah. Good old, he was, he's fantastic. I mean, does that really Fox, ring? Putting does that, Fox that, that aside. Yeah. Some of that is, is it's, it's all factual, but some of it doesn't ring true. The, the last part that doesn't ring true, because the DOD isn't interested, interested in, in finding it. out. I mean, that's, I mean a, really? that's a double-edged sword. I mean, they're interested enough that there are staffers <laughs> in their program, but they're not interested. That's why Elizondo left, to make the protest that they should be much more interested than they are. They should be supporting this program. And they should be taking an interest in us, and they're not. And they're making it very difficult for the program to function. And that was what he wrote in his resignation letter to the Secretary of Defense, which was a pretty brave thing for somebody to do, to write that letter. It's never, that to me is historic. You're talking about history. That letter is, to me, is history because mm. he, it was written to the, the, the Secretary of Defense. So, and it was specifically, I, it specifically I, said, it's say, speaking the truth that there's yeah, not enough interest yeah. at the DOD to find out what these things are. Wow. He's right. Is that because, and, and it, do you think there's any sorry. chance that that's because they've already come to some, like, yeah. is there any evidence that that's because they've come to some Other, conclusion that they can't, well, you know, they're not going to get it. They can't catch it. I don't have evidence of that. I mean, but my experience, my interviews are with people involved with that program. Nothing and off the, the record. You could like blink program. twice. Who have access to this? What's that? Nothing even off the record. Like maybe you could blink twice for yes or once. No, for I mean I. All I know. I'm no. I'm speaking to you. I mean you know. And I'm not saying I know everything. Yeah. I don't. But all I what I do know is the people inside that program 
have not given me any indication that they already know the answers. Far from it. But they know a lot more than they're able to talk about. Yeah, because of the classification, yeah. Because yeah. of the class, yeah. but it's not like they've solved the mystery of what, where these things come from, or any of that. You know, the bigger questions of are there creatures piloting them, or where are they from, or why are they here? Those questions, absolutely not, not solved by that program. If somebody else knows the answers to that, that could be, but they're not sharing that with the people I've talked to who have been working on this. Unless you know, they're, they're not telling me, yeah. but you know, yeah. all you yeah. know is. As a journalist, you report on, you, you develop trusted relationships with sources and you report on what they tell you. I mean, I guess the other thing I took away from the Tucker Carlson clip, and then I'll, I'll let it go because I guess I've kind of <laughs> hammered on this enough, but everything he's saying is true as well about, we, we and, and you acknowledge this, we have so many uh, well-substantiated accounts and he referenced O'Hare Airport, which is phenomenal because hundreds of people saw it. There was video from all over the place, a bunch of different angles. So I, I just, it, it again, I've said this before, it just doesn't ring true that our beloved, you know, media who protects us and is fighting for stories and just, you know what, Jay-Z and, uh, and Kanye's recent thing on Trump, you know, that beat out this other story on that we are not alone, that we are not, uh, you know, we're being visited by aliens from another planet. Oh, well, sorry, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jay-Z beat that out. <laughs> we oh, can't, whoa, whoa, no, wait, whoa, Alex. Whoa, 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 we can't say that. Oh, let's get Neil deGrasse Tyson to say, oh, no, it's just unidentified means unidentified, you know, right? He's right. That's true. We can't no, prove he's it. Not we're being right. visited. We, we're not, we don't know if we're being visited by aliens or not, for sure. We don't know that at a level of proof. I agree with yes, that. It, we well, don't. we don't know any. That's if the difference. Did, it, that's that's just a misunderstanding of what proof means. We don't know anything at a level of proof. We have our given assumptions, our given beliefs, and then we say, "What would it take for me to change those beliefs?" So I, I, I get it. That isn't even kind of relevant. I kind of pounded that. I think the second <laughs> clip from uh, from Carlson is even more interesting to me because, again, I'm conspiratorial, so I'm sort of reading into. Lou's comments here, but when, when Lou speaks up, I mean, he sounds so desperate. Uh, he protesteth too much, you know, kind of thing. Can you play that one? Lou Elizondo is a former Pentagon official. He helped research UFOs. He said the DOD is not taking any of this seriously for some reason. Mr. Elizondo joins us tonight. Lou, good to see you. Thank you for having so me. So did I overstate that? Is there a growing corpus of evidence, not drunk people on a lonely rural road at three in the morning, but sober military pilots saying something that we can't explain is happening? That is correct. You're talking about individuals who have very high security clearances. They are trained observers. We've actually paid them and put them through schools to be trained and very keen observers uh, to scrutinize what they're seeing. Uh, these are individuals who we trust to fly uh, weapons platforms, sometimes with live munitions, over U.S. cities and to fight and win wars on our behalf. And they're reporting to us that they're seeing something that they can't explain. And it's also being backed up by the video evidence and the radar data. Yeah, so what is your problem, <laughs> Alex? <laughs> <laughs> My problem is just, again, it just doesn't ring true on a level of, again, I, I put Richard Dolan in this seat, right? Because Richard Dolan is a real UFO researcher. He's not some crackpot podcaster like me and like these whoa, Canucks whoa, over whoa, here. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but for the people that have researched it, have dug through, and, I, and I've interviewed tons of them. I, you know, I interviewed Jacques Vallée just recently and. Uh, Stan Friedman again. You know, these people have done thousands of pages of FOI information and read thousands and thousands. I mean, they sit there and go, well, wait a minute. For 50 years, we have all this documentation that they've known. So it right. just doesn't ring true, for, well, that, Lou that's to, true. For, yeah. for Lou to come out and say, well, you know, it got, gee, gosh darn people, why aren't you paying attention? And it's like, hey, Lou, Start from the beginning. Start from Project Blue Book. Start from Swamp Gas. Start from there and bring us all the way up to date on all the things that have happened since then. And then and lay it all on the table. And then maybe we'll eat from that table. But don't do this John Podesta, Hillary Clinton, 
have said they're going to disclose and now they got backstabbed. So now they bring this out kind of that's how it looks kind of thing and expect everyone just to lean up against the table and go, wow, let's eat up the latest version of how the world really works. I think, Alex, what you have to realize, number one, is he was, he had three minutes on Tucker Carlson. He was responding to the question he was asked. He doesn't have time to, to go back to the beginning in that context. I'm sure if there was another context, maybe he could. But the other thing is, I think, you know, we all know a lot about UFOs. So to us, it just seems obvious. Most people don't know anything about UFOs. And I think a lot of us forget that the frustration that you're expressing of like, yeah, for 50 years, we've had all this data and these great people like Stan Friedman have studied it and they've already made these statements over and over again. Why don't we get it? I mean, most people haven't even been exposed to that stuff. And we are a small percentage of the population that have knowledge about this. So there's that, plus there's the stigma in the culture that's still very strong, that people think UFOs are some kind of a joke. You wouldn't believe how many people don't want to be associated with it, even though they know a lot about it and they've had experiences or whatever. Because of that, people are afraid of career problems in the military if they talk about it. So that squelches it, along with the fact that most people don't know anything about it. So for a Somebody to come out of the DOD and go on Fox TV and say what Lou just said for them is a really big deal. For us, it seems like nothing because mm -hmm. we already know. Well, Leslie, that's awesome. I, I like the way you sum that up. You certainly have the credibility to say that because you've lived it with your book, which I was kind of surprised. I mean, your book is the disclosure book that everyone points to. I just have to tell you, you know that, but whether you like the term or not. So you've, you've, live that life and walk that. So I, I totally respect what you're saying in that regard. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's very easy to forget because we're, it's so obvious to us. Yeah. That's a good point. It does put it in context. <laughs> Nine and days so before Christmas doesn't help on. either. I mean, Trump's and signing those crazy executive orders and it's nine days before Christmas. I mean, some of that in a lot of ways might've got steamrolled over as well. Who knows? But I, I, all I know is that what I've taken on is my job, which is a different job from what Stanton Friedman and Richard Dolan and a lot of the other people do, is to try to take the most credible information into the mainstream, into the status quo, into the laps of the policymakers to make it that they can't, so they can't avoid it and they have to deal with it. And the only way to do that is to provide the kinds of information that's in my book, that the kind of information that Lou has. But if you go off on too much else, it closes it down even more to that particular component of the pop, you know, of the country, which is, so that's my particular interest is to try to break through that. Other people's jobs are to do other things, yeah. no, but that's, that's not point. my yeah. job, you yeah. know, and, and Richard Dolan or others might be dealing more with other issues and disclosure and conspiracies and all this stuff that I'm not going to bring to the table with the people that I'm dealing with. Cause it's just going to backfire for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. And you've done a great job of that. I mean, your book and, and this article, and I can tell other, other stuff you're working on coming up, hopefully. I mean, have you got, did you I, get any headway on, you know, how I went at the beginning, I was talking about the suggesting the suggestion of a, of a, of an agency to deal with this. Has there been any headway, headway on that at all? Yeah. It's kind of an irony because what I was proposing in my book, this was like, you know, when I wrote the book, which came out in 2010, was um, I was sort of assuming that there are government agencies sort of interested in this and that are probably secretly developing it. It might just be a few people here and there, but there was obviously going to be something going on. You don't ignore something like this. So I was sort of proposing that there be another government office set up that's pub that was a public office that was sort of like Blue Book but without the problems of Blue Book. Yeah. In other words, that was <laughs> legitimate, that didn't didn't try to you know, debunk things and they did a proper job and it could have like a board of really good people. And, you know, I had this whole plan of, and it wouldn't cost anything, but it would, it would bring government. It would, it would involve the government in a way that would allow it to work with other countries, which have these offices already. Yeah. But now that we've discovered that there's this, there's this DOD agency, I don't know. I have to sort of um, think about, I mean, it still to me would be a positive development. I don't think it's ever going to happen at this point. But it would be a positive development because this would be an office that would that would deal with the public, whereas I think the DOD stuff, as you know, all the classified stuff and all of that, is just inaccessible. But if we had another little agency where there was a point person where people could, you know, legitimate cases could be investigated and so on, 
you know, it would be a positive. But, you know, I think I've sort of put all of that on a back burner yeah, at this yeah, point yeah, yeah. because um, of these new new developments. And, um, I, you know, so I just have to rethink the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do want to give you enough time to talk about your surviving death book as well. But I also thought maybe while we're talking about all this, we should probably get your take on um, – the to the stars Academy and how they play into this whole, this whole thing and, and the future of disseminating this information to the public and how they're supposed to be looking at the technology aspect and the entertainment aspect. And um, were you involved in with them at all or how did, did they cross over with this at all? Or does it, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I really haven't been involved. I mean, of course, Elizondo is involved with them right. and he's a, one of our sources. Okay. Um, and I've, I've worked with, uh, Hal put off for many years. I mean, he's, he's advised me on many things over the years. I have great, res I have great respect for the people involved, mm -hmm. but I really, uh, I'm not involved myself and I don't really feel in a position to comment on, on the organization. Um, you know, I wish them well, but I, I just, I, I'm not sort of linked in in any way with, with that entity. With so, Stars. so Alessandro was doing, was he talking to you in, in this, in this article, in this sense it, on his own or as part of TTSA? On his own. Okay. On his own. Okay. I mean, it, sure. it, yeah, we started, sure. I mean, the first meeting I had from him with him, he was completely independent. It was literally the day, I think, or the day or the day after that he had left the DOD where I met him. He had not gone on to do anything else yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was working with us as a source and did interviews with us as an independent person, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alex, do you have anything else before we switch, switch gears or, or Darren? No, no, I, I, I really, really, really do appreciate Leslie, you know, kind of handling that. And, and I hope, no, I'm not even going to apologize. I like pushing on those buttons. I, I, yeah, cause I, I feel like so many people have talked to you and you can almost hear them wanting to take that next step and no one did. So that's no, why I appreciate it. these guys. But do you feel, uh, Alex, do you feel like there's things that we haven't resolved somehow? Or, I mean, I, well, you know. If I feel some like kind you're telling. I feel like you're telling it, the truth. I feel like I'm telling what I know. All yeah. I can do is to, and if there may be some kind of giant conspiracy, like people are speculating about, and I may be, you know, that may exist, and I don't know anything about it. All I can say is I've never seen evidence that shows me that that kind of thing is going on, and the people on the inside who I've spoken to have confirmed that. Well, I so, mean. There doesn't have that's, to be a giant conspiracy. There can just be the, the conspiracy that's laid right in front of our eyes that Graham yeah, hit on, you know, you know, the two, the stars it Academy all depends. and Tom DeLong saying, you know, Hey guys, we, we, we really do have UFOs and we do, there are aliens and we're going to get free energy out of it. Like that just sounds so like such a, a contrived, claim. such a contrived kind of thing. But you know what I, I tell you, maybe a transitional question is, you wrote a fantastic book on survival of consciousness, and I know you wanted to go more in that direction because the last time I interviewed you on Skeptico, I know that's a strong passion of yours. How has this kind of latest move, you know, they'll they pull me back in every time I try and get out, you know, have you exactly. felt any of that at all? Or Yeah, I mean, what, what happened was, I mean, the, the whole UFO story in the Times was a, was a distraction from this. That's what you mean. It kind of took me away from that topic. Um, and I wasn't planning on that. I mean, I had no idea that suddenly in October there would be this meeting that would absolutely change everything, you know, mm -hmm. and that we'd spend, you know, from October till December working on this piece and then it would come out and then it'd be all the stuff that would happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was all that was like three or four months of that I didn't ever anticipate any of that stuff happening. So, I mean, I had, a, I was going to go give lectures in Europe at one point. I had a lecture all lined up. And I canceled the whole trip because of this article. This, this thing just took over my life. So now, I mean, as, as much as I, as I said to you, we're trying to, you know, dig and trying to get another story going and trying to learn as more all the time. Um, I'm still happy to sort of be able to shift a little bit more back into the progression of the other book. I mean, I'm interested in both things, but yeah, I, as, as are we. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the surviving death book for me. Uh, is something that I have a lot more to learn about. Um, and it's very fascinating me because of that. You know, it's not, I mean, I spent so many years studying UFOs, whereas this other stuff is newer for me. So, and it's in some ways more compelling and more mysterious. 
so I'm very drawn to it. Let's you guys' it roles way. are very but, reversed in that sense. You guys should be like trading stories. Because I would consider Alex probably one of the, you know, foremost forerunners in, in that field these days. In, in well, my, my show, I would too. Maybe, maybe my show is, but you, you well, know Well, that what, counts. You mean, I mean, you bring that knowledge <laughs> to the table then. No, I mean, you, you can you sit and have a conversation. Interviews. Well, you know what? No, there's I, an interesting I, I, point I agree there. With that. Leslie, and, uh, Leslie, we kind of talked about this the, the last time, but maybe it's mm -hmm. even more pertinent now is this link between consciousness and extended consciousness and UFOs is all over the place. And as Graham mentioned earlier, you know, when you talk to Jacques Vallée has kind of been the Pied Piper and he's kind of converted everybody in the field. But that is the, some people even can't bear the thought of someone even talking about a flying craft, the kind that this video exposes. And that's a whole other story we could get into in terms of the twists and turns this is taking in the in the UFO community. But from your perspective, since you've been in both, do you do you have any additional thoughts about the consciousness, extended consciousness connection to the UFO phenomena? You know, I, I just don't think I'm the person to talk to about it. I mean, I, I think it's a really valid and interesting thing to explore, but I just have not focused on it because, you know, of the type of reporting I do. It wasn't exactly related to the New York Times story, right? Right. So it's not like I've really been applying myself in that way. When it comes to UFOs, I've always thought of them as just sort of this physical phenomenon that I'm trying to let the government know exists, period. Right. You know, and I'm just focused on the least strange parts of it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Which is just the radar and the blah, blah, blah. We're in the, yes, but there are all these really, really strange paranormal things associated with UFOs. And I just don't normally deal with those and because of the particular job that I have, you know, it's not that they're not interesting to me or they're not. And they're also an important part of the UFO phenomenon. I don't think any, but it's just not something that I've put my attention on because as I sort of was saying earlier, I have a specific job to do, you know what I mean? And I can't do everything. Yeah. I but that see being having, said, yeah. you know, I think maybe it'll be something that I'll be more interested in as time passes. And I know that there's other people that are thinking a lot about it. And I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I what, can see I really you having did. to separate yourself like that for sure. What got you? In, in I mean, I just, yeah, it's just what I've done. And then I did this book that involves consciousness, but I haven't really put that together with the UFO phenomenon. I sort of have always thought of them as completely separate. But maybe someday that'll that will. Oh yeah, you'll me. you'll get there. You'll get there. That's where. It, yeah, I mean, that's you know. where it goes. Um, what what got you into the the consciousness stuff? Was that just like an assignment, um, or is it a personal experience of some sort? Or I've been interested in it really for a long, long. I mean, the question being, do we survive death? You know, is death the end? And um, and is there evidence that suggests? I mean, solid evidence. You know, not just anecdotal stories, but real evidence that suggests that we do survive death. And I've, I've, I've been involved with that question for quite a long time, even while I was doing UFOs. And there were periods of time where I was involved with documentaries that were made about it. And I did reading on it and I traveled and met mediums and stuff like that. And always sort of had it in the background. Um, and so it was sort of the natural topic for me to take up next because my uh, crown publishing at, at, at Random House who did the UFO book were interested in having me do another book. And this just seemed like the natural topic for me. So I was very pleased to be able to do it. Because, but it's not like I had studied it as thoroughly as I had studied UFOs. And it was different because I drew from a lot of different areas. You know, each section of my book could be a whole book unto itself. Whereas the UFO seemed simple. UFO topic seems simple to me compared to this. Leslie, can, can you break that down a little bit for, for people? Because you really do do that. I mean, people who are familiar with your UFO book will find the same kind of careful, measured, kind of very grounded approach in the survival death, surviving death book. But you do kind of touch on areas that there's so much to touch on, but you got into, you know, like you said, mediumship and you get into past lives and you get into. Right. And you, and you really do a fantastic job with them. But what are some Thank of the areas you. you touch on? And I think that's also, I think the material is much weirder than UFOs. I felt like I was taking more of a risk because I will, I'll describe the areas, but a part of the book was also my own personal experiences, which 
are completely just what happened to me. It's like, you know, and that, that felt anyway, that makes the book a lot more meaningful, but it's, it's also going way out on a limb, much more on the limb that I'd gone with before with the UFO book, I felt. But yeah, I mean, I studied, um, you know, it's a book starts with cases of young children who have past life recollections that with, you know, much, very, very specific information that can later be verified as being tied to the life of one specific person. And those cases to me are among the most compelling evidence we have. They're very hard to explain any other way than looking at them as a, a reincarnation case. And then there's the whole near-death experience, um, you know, or what what Sam Parnia calls actual death experiences, ah, which I really what like. I like to, that's what I like to say, uh, too, is it's not near because a lot of times you're there. And it's too vague. I mean, he says there's no... There's nothing, there really, no way to define what that means. As far as Parney is concerned, people are actually dead when they hit. And, and I talk in the book about, you know, his, his cases of people that have been dead for like an hour and a half or something. Yeah. And then they, they come back and they remember. So, um, uh, and I think Alex is really an expert on NDEs, way more than I am. But I, I didn't go into it a lot in the book because I figured it's something a lot of people know a lot about already. And so I, and again, I had so many things to cover that I couldn't, go into it in a lot of depth, but I think that what I presented was interesting. And then I also had, and have 10 chapters written by other people, which is another similarity to the UFO book. And I think Pim Von Lomo wrote this fantastic chapter in my book about consciousness and NDEs. And I love what he writes. Um, and then there's life between life stuff and, and also end of life experiences that happen when people are consciously dying that are very similar to, to NDEs in certain ways. And then I get into this whole section about um, with mediums. Which, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, tell people about that. Oh my God, it's so fascinating. Communication, yeah. Yeah, because you know the initial section of the book just sort of establishes the fact that consciousness appears to be able to function separately from the brain. That doesn't prove that it goes what happens when we die, but if you can establish that, then the question comes up: Well, if that's true, and even with these reincarnation cases, if it's like a personality that's going from one life to another, is it possible to communicate with that consciousness when it's not, you know, when it's not in that body? To me, that's a, that was the natural question that I see my book as sort of a progression of questions. And that question of communication is so fascinating to me. And so the way that, you know, that one tends to explore that is through mediumship. Um, and I started off with mental mediumship and, um, you know, explained how it works and everything, which I'm sure people probably already know about. But what was fascinating to me was that I had two extraordinary readings myself with two different mediums. And they were, you know, the mediums knew nothing about me, not even my name. And I describe, so I go into the book and I describe that and, and I list some of the very specific points that were made and uh, how it affected me. It was absolutely mind blowing. Um, so, you know, there's a, what's interesting about this material, too, is that you can go out and experience it for yourself and test it, whereas with UFOs, you can't decide to see one. Mm, you this, try. you can jump in, and you can test the waters, and you can have readings, and you can, you know, do the various things that might connect you to a bigger consciousness, or you can meditate and do all the things that allow you to explore this for yourself. And so I did that as part of my research in, in doing the book. Um, and... I just found mental mediumship. When you have a good reading, it's just mind-blowing. But again, then the question becomes, is this just the medium using her advanced clairvoyance and telepathy, or is it an actual dead person that's communicating mm -hmm. through her? And that's the big question that is up for debate that doesn't seem provable one way or the other. But either way, it's fascinating. But it's fascinating, and even either way, the scientific establishment will tell you that this can't happen. And yeah. in fact, it does. Regardless of the source of the information, they will tell you that such a, a, a reading is a, it's an impossibility, you know. And so that, too, is part of my motivation for writing the book. I know Alex deals with that all the time. It's like the, the unbelievable that these guys will look you in the face and say these things don't happen, that you have directly experienced happening. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. people like Sean Carroll. Anyway, I wrote a little article where I dealt with yeah. Sean Carroll. But yeah, anyway, he's, he's just it's just phenomenal. So. Um, and then, you know, so I, I like to explore the question of psi versus, you know, where's the source of this information? And what are the things that most suggest that it is coming from a deceased being as opposed to the psi of the, and there are things that highly suggest that. that how, it is not. how would you tease that apart a little bit? 
Well, one thing I did was I presented a case. First of all, I interviewed the mediums, the two that in length that, that read for me. They didn't even know I was writing a book, of course, when I did the readings with them. But um, later, I w- and, and they were able to, to say that they could discern the difference. But again, this is subjective. The yeah, skeptics yeah. really. But they can discern the difference between when they're doing a psychic reading versus a mediumistic reading, which means a, a reading that ac- they, they, they feel is accessing deceased entities. They say it's a different part of their brain. It's a different, different scenario. So, you know, you can take their word for it or not. But the other thing is I, I had a case I presented in the book in which nobody on the planet knew the information that was presented so that therefore uh, it could, wasn't really wouldn't be excessive, ex- accessible through telepathy. You know, it stretches the limits of what we might understand to be the capacity of the human mind to look at some of the more extreme cases. Well, that's just, you know, and then when you get into more advanced mediumship, it stretches it even further, like trance mediumship and and the whole notion of dropping communicators, which I find absolutely fascinating. And Alan Gold wrote this great chapter in my book. And he's one of, I mean, he is an incredible expert on this stuff and very, uh, you know, an elderly distinguished British psychologist who is no bullshit. He's very conservative. He's been studying this stuff forever. He's a scholar. And he's he's presenting some of the information that is the most, uh, you know, stretch, is the most evidential that there is survival. And even for him to acknowledge that is a big deal. So dropping communicators are one thing. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if we have time to go into well, all of could, that. Could we? Because I don't know if yeah. I, yeah. I don't know, I don't know just, if it's something little- I'm... If I'm talking too much here. No, or, no, know. no. I'd like to know about that. But Darren, you, what did you want to no, say? No, you finished that thought up. My question is going to be more of a uh, overarching. Okay. What's a job yeah, communicator? What I, mean, I, I mean, so there, then there's, there's, then there's trans mediumship and there's physical mediumship, which are two different things, but trans mediumship is where the medium is basically unconscious and the communicator speaks directly through her. I'm going to say her because most of the mediums have been female. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so she's basically in this trance state and the communicator can come directly through and speak to the sitter. And there was some, been some famous ones like Mrs. Leonore Piper, another one uh, who's historically unbelievably famous and has been searched up the wazoo by scientists. And so well, anyway, what a drop in community. So the, it can happen with a trance mediumship, but I think it more often happens with physical mediumship, actually. Physical mediumship are when the medium is in, in a trance, leaves his body, and the communicator comes into the body, and then physical things happen in the room that the, the communicators facilitate somehow. Things that can <laughs> that anybody, any scientist would say can't possibly happen, and yeah. they actually do happen, because yeah, yeah. I've seen it myself. Of course, you have to have a very controlled environment and make sure there's no, ho- you know, people hoaxing anything. And that's the tricky part. But if you can do that, these things actually do happen. And they've been documented throughout history, um, such as levitations and things moving around and materializations and that kind of stuff. Voices in the room. Um, and so what a dropping communicator is, is when, um, uh, let's just, an example being in a physical physical mediumship where, some communicator comes through the um, the uh, medium that nobody in the room knows or has any connection to, because um, usually the sitters, the communicators are connected to the sitters, or there's one communicator or a bunch of them, let's say two or three, that work regularly with that medium, so they always come every week, mm-hmm. and they're sort of like that medium's group that they work with. And so when you have somebody else come in out of the blue that is not being called in by any of the sitters, is not connected to them, and they seem to have a purpose for being there, and they give enough information that um, about their lives, say, you know, when they lived and blah, 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 that you can go and find out that this person actually lived. This is what happened with one case with this uh, Icelandic medium. Um, he, he, this, this, it was way, way early in the century and everybody wrote down what he said, but nobody checked it out. And then years later, Erlander Haraldson, who's an excellent investigator from Iceland, went to the, to Denmark. There's a lot of details that, that show the disconnect of this communicator to the medium, but was able to verify that this person actually lived mm-hmm. with the same name, the same age, you know, all these details that that person had provided but you can't really argue that the sitters or the medium 
somehow created that themselves because he was com- this communicator was completely disconnected from them. Nobody knew anything about him. And we know that he actually lived. And what was his message again to them? Um, this guy, his name was um, Jensen. He didn't have much of it. Well, the reason he dropped in one yeah. night said there's a fire. This was in Iceland. And he spoke in Danish, which is a language that the medium didn't even speak. He said there's a fire in Copenhagen right now, raging out of control. And this was at a certain time. So they wrote down the time and everything. And then he said a few things about the fire. I list the facts in my book. There may be four or five points he made about the fire, what time it started, when they came to put it out, where it was raging, a few things like that. And then he went away and then he came back later and said, the fire has gone out. And so he didn't really have anything more to say beyond. He was just very agitated about this fire. And, um, the point being the, the Erlander was able to find out years and years later that this guy who was this, this Jensen guy actually lived two doors down from where the fire took place, which explained why he was so upset about it. And it gave a purpose for why he would feel a need to sort of, I mean, be around and be agitated about this thing, which is one of the criteria that researchers have for drop-ins, that there should be a reason for why they would be compelled to come in. And this sort of explained that, yeah. but nobody knew it at the time. Yeah. It was just all written down. So that, I just find that really compelling and that, that everything that that guy Jensen said about himself was able to be lo- – he was able to verify it all through a lot of different sources too. In obscure you know, business logs in, uh, in Copenhagen that documented like in 1920 there was a, a merchant that did this you – know, and this person was buried over here. And it was all these dis- um, disparate different sources – so if a skeptic wanted to argue, well, the medium used his psychic abilities to get that information, <laughs> that medium would have had to have clairvoyantly gone to all these very, very obscure places to get the information in the first place in a language that he didn't even understand and to be accurate. And so it makes more sense to argue that the, the spirit of this being was actually there, yeah. you know, and, and that they were able to verify it later. I mean, if you have a drop in that you can't verify, it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I so think the, there's the there, there, I think there's the risk too that that the drop-ins. Uh, I mean, you have to don't they have to protect themselves? I mean, did you through all this research did you find these mediums having to protect themselves from unwanted visitors or making sure that it's not you know there's not a drop in there that's not supposed to be there? It's probably a concern. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point. I'm sure, and I'm sure there are many of them that don't even give enough information to be meaningful anyway. Yeah. You know, they just show up, or maybe they are negative entities. But I think most of the mediums have ways of protecting themselves from. I mean, I know the medium that I work with in um, England, the one I've sat with many times, is they do this little sort of prayer in the beginning of the sitting, in which they just say, "We put a ring of protection yeah. around our yeah. medium." You know, we yeah. ask the spirit world to protect him from unwanted. And there's never been any problems that he's had yeah, with yeah. any kind of negativity coming in. So I don't know, but I, you know, I think the main thing is that there'll be drop-ins that only come once and they don't say, they don't give you enough information and you just sort of forget about it. Yeah. You know, I recently but, heard a, a little bit of information that backs up what Leslie's saying. I, I interviewed uh, Dr. Bernardo Castro recently, and he told me about uh, some study that was recently done in Brazil with trance mediums, where right exactly what you're saying, Leslie, they, they kind of tested them. They did the fMRI test. If anyone's familiar with this with this notion that what they're finding are these extended consciousness realms are often associated with a reduction in neural activity in areas that we would expect just the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So people are having these unbelievably, as they report them, fantastic experiences we'd expect their brain to be lighting up under the current neurological right. model and what we see is the opposite that the brain is shutting down so and the interpretation is that somehow consciousness is connecting in a way the deeper truer consciousness is connecting in a way that we don't totally understand but what they found in this brazil study is the trance mediums had that same reduction and neural activity in a specific part of their brain associated with trans mediumship. And it was different when they were doing psychic mediumship. So it was yeah. confirming on both counts. Oh. One, that there was this reduction in activity. And two, that it was truly as they experienced it and reported it, 
two different kinds of experience. I just thought that was, you I know, think again, it's, it's great it's, too. It's yeah. Occam's razor cutting the other way. I mean, the skeptics always want to say, and the materialists, we shouldn't say skeptics. I hate that because this is yeah, science. Materialists. Yeah. This is just mainstream science. This is what neuroscience says and all that. But they always want to cut. Isn't the simpler explanation this? And as you just pointed out, and I think you did a great job, it isn't really the simpler explanation, not right. super psi, that it's spirits. However, I know. I mean, yeah. and they're both pretty, pretty out there, but. Right. The point is the phenomena are real. So you so you know, you can interpret it either way, but yeah, I think it makes complete sense. They did a and, and met, there was a I wrote about it in my book too. One of the mental mediums who I sat with, Laura Lynn Jackson, who's an excellent medium. They somebody did a brain study of, of her brain, brain scan, and when she did a psychic reading, it showed activity in one part of her brain. When she did a mediumistic reading, it showed activity in another part of the brain, which is wow. I thought was it doesn't prove that one side is speaking to dead people, but you know, but it shows at least that it's different than the psychic. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, which is a step, a step in the right direction there. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. you know, I think so it's coming. I mean, I think it's coming It's work that you guys have both done in this field. It's two of the biggest questions. It's what happens after we die and are we alone? I mean, those are two questions that, that you guys are, you know, leading the way and, and, making a difference in the world that people are opening up to it. I really think it's changed even over the last few years. I mean, what, what was your overarching question, Darren? Well, I would, I kind of disagree that our wheel, I don't think, I think our wheel alone is a little farther down the list than one or two. I think it's maybe in the top five, maybe, right. maybe it even slips the top 10. But so that was kind of my question for Leslie is, you know, spending all that time researching UFOs is, is one thing, you know, you can kind of become more or less of a believer in, and UFOs, and that's that's great. But I mean, when it comes to consciousness, that can become a lot more deeply personal. So when you start doing all this research and looking into all this stuff, I'm wondering, you know, did that have any sort of? Are you different now than you were when you started the book? I mean, because this this stuff kind of has that ability a lot more than than flying saucers, I would argue. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. I think it does have much more of an internal uh, effect. For me, anyway, it did because I could directly experience this. As I was saying, I can't. I've never seen a UFO. I'm come, not a. Come I'm to not Calgary. We'll take, we'll take you out one night, and when you come to Calgary, don't do it. Don't do <laughs> okay. it. Don't do it. Leslie. I'd love to see one, but <laughs> this stuff you can really engage with it. You know, to the extent that you want to. And I, I was fortunate enough to have two extraordinary readings, which are not easy to come by. I was, I've been fortunate enough to receive communications that seemed to be from my brother who sadly died during the time I was writing this book. Yeah. But it was amazing the timing of it because, um, you know, I was in this mindset of very receptive, of high receptivity after he died. And it, it really, really was tragic for me that he died. Um, and I, I mean, and I even brought that in the book. I remember thinking hard, do I dare do this? You know, what do people <laughs> think I've gone off the, Lizzie Kane's gone off the deep end, you know? But I tried to present it in a way that just says, this is what happened, you know, make of it what you will. But when it happens to you, yeah, it's so transformative, you know, in a way that UFOs just aren't. And I also think experiencing physical mediumship, when you experience, uh, you know, psychokinesis and all these things that are not supposed to be able to happen, and you can actually witness it for yourself, that has a different effect than studying other people's accounts of UFOs. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. I would tend to so. agree. That's sort of my outlook on the show is that, you know, those ones tend to hit, to to stay with me a little longer than the UFO stuff. And I mean, that's just, a, I mean, we have a ton of listeners that are all in on the UFO stuff. But for me, the, the spirituality and the stuff that, that kind of stuff just seems a little more uh, tangible. Well, and we have a lot of people yeah. sharing their experiences with us on both those topics. You know, their lucid dreams, out of bodies, um, uh, spirit communication, UFOs, all that stuff. And I think now finally people are feeling like there is a platform. They can say it. They can. They they like it when we read their stuff out on the on the show. And and people are I don't know they're more open to it now. So I'm really ho I'm really hopeful. I think in the next few years that it's and as long as this platform stays uncensored and we're able to do this, I think it's it's. It'll be uh, it'll be good. Did you ever get to interview yep. Podesta while you were doing the whole disclosure? Well, UFO he wrote thing? the foreword to her her book. Oh, really? Yeah. How was yeah, that? Yeah, no, he's 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 huh? How was that? What and what what, what, what do you mean? I don't know. He just looks so <laughs> weird to me. He's like, 
you know. Well, you got to be more specific. I'm not going to go down the whole Podesta road right now, but I mean, he's just, he's quite the character and he's, he's super kind of, you know, he, 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 wear, he plays the part well and uh, he's just got to be something else to be around. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, it's not like I hung or hang around him or anything. You did not even want to get to hang out with them at all though. Oh, I've met him. I've had meetings with him over the years. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, I mean, I, if there's some way that he can be helpful, he'll be helpful. Yeah. But other than that, he's, I'm not engaged. You know, I'm not particularly engaged with him, but he's definitely, um, been very helpful over the years, you know, especially during the, by writing for writing the forward of the book. And then before that, I was involved with him with this lawsuit against NASA, and he was very supportive of that. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so How'd that go? he's been helpful. How'd the lawsuit go? That was, oh, that was an interesting adventure that lasted probably five or six years where, um, it, it, I mean, it's a long story, but it was the Kecksburg UFO case. Are you familiar oh, with that case? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so I, I was, I had a, a lawyer working with me, a PR firm, because I was uh, the Sci Fi Channel provided this budget for this to happen. And um, we did this for it was all it was a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit because the NASA did not uh, cooperate with our FOIA requests as they were required to under the law. So we ended up going to court and the judge was very supportive of us. And we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents that I had to go through. It was extremely complicated. And requesting the documents was extremely complicated and quite boring really but a lot of work and we ended up getting lots and lots of stuff but nothing about the Kexburg case huh. bastards which was which revealed a lot in itself yeah exactly and, you know, yeah that's how they get you that's the government for you yeah i, I mean you, i would not have the patience to deal with the government on the level that that <laughs> it took a lot of patience to do this believe me I and bet. then I wrote up this long report at the end. It was just very kind of dry, you know, information and just what did it show? And it was very technical. And, uh, you know, what did it mean that we didn't get anything and all of that? It was a long, you know, but Podesta was always interested in um, the, the people's right to information, you know, in open government. That was sort of a, a theme that he had back in the days when he was at the uh, Center for American Progress. Before he became involved with, um, I guess he he left. He was chief of staff with Clinton. Then he went to back to the to the uh, Center for American Progress. That's when he was helping us. And then he went to work with Obama for a while. Um, and now he's sort of doing his thing. And he did something with ancient aliens. I was amazed that he did that, but he did. Oh yeah, <laughs> Alex. Yeah, you, you shared that with us, Alex. I, mean, I didn't get a chance to them. watch it. I couldn't. I couldn't see no. it. But. Everything's cool now. We should not. Uh, we should. Okay. End it here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, is there anything else before we let you go, Leslie, that uh, you or Alex want to mention, or that you think we well, should? I was going to ask. Or? I was going to ask when she was going to do a nice expose on uh, podcasts and podcasters and and that whole up and coming. What do you What do you genre. mean by that? <laughs> Pitch well, the story better well, than that. Well, Taylor. I Come mean, on, I mean. Something. Come on, it's it's anyone who's paying attention knows that radio is on the way out. I mean, what's it got? Five, maybe ten years left. Anyone who's looking knows. Even even the people who are doing radio know that, and they're all trying to yeah. ju- they're all trying to jump into podcasts, but it's too late. And no one wants to listen to their shit on podcasts. <laughs> so I mean, audio is gonna fall, and no one wants to talk yeah. about it. Some of these Wired magazines and tech magazines are are kind of talking about it, but what's what's gonna replace audio or radio? It seems like podcasts are probably going to replace radio yeah. and who's going to be at well, the I, forefront. It doesn't seem like all these major players yeah. are going to have the same control. Like when it comes to podcasts, the New York times isn't going to matter. Then no one's going to, I listen to the New York times podcast. It sucks. No one's going to listen to it. I'm like, you know, there's no chance. So I right. mean, what, what's, what's that look like in 10 years when it's, when it's Joe Rogan and when it's getting on Joe Rogan, that fucking, so that matters more yeah. than the New York Times. I don't know. I mean, you guys probably know more about that than I do. I don't know. I just hope I can listen to the radio when I'm in my car. <laughs> Your car will come with a podcast player. All right. That's easy. Yeah. I guess it's okay. I don't know. I'm really, I'm just, I don't know anything about this kind of stuff. I'm sorry. You guys know more than I do. Well, we're looking forward to more of, of this, uh, you know, this, sort of aspects of disclosure coming from you and, and your team and whether it's the New York times or whatever, hopefully there's more. I hope so too. I really want to try to make it happen, but it's, 
Yeah. But, you know, it's a tall order. Yeah. I think the conscious yeah. stuff is fun. Conscious stuff is funner anyway. I sort of know what you mean. <laughs> well, I, I mean, is there any thought about putting some, even if you had something recent or something fresh from, you know, from your book, like the consciousness after death stuff? I mean, would the New York Times, would you have any leg in there for that kind of thing? No, I mean, it's, it's a news, you know, it's a news outlet. No, I mean, you know, the only conceivable thing might be some kind of, mag they have a Sunday magazine. Yeah. Is that sorry? But is that the, second book out already, or that's just yeah? Ready to oh go yeah, out? it's out. Yeah, yeah it's out. Yeah, it's it came out in that. March of 2017, and then yeah. the uh, paperback just came out in March of 2018. Yeah, beauty. Um, yeah. Have you gotten? No, I'm, have you gotten it, tons of stories from that? I'm sure you get an unbelievable amount of email from surviving death. Have you ever thought of? turning that into some or doing anything with that publishing it in any form or? yeah i mean i want to go through because i've gotten some so many beautiful letters about how this has helped people yeah. you know and yeah. i i think it's i think i would like to do is when i have the time is to go through them all and maybe put some of them on my website it's not so much to promote the book as to show the power that this information has yep. do you, you have know, the book it, there can you hold it up um you know the only problem i only have my one without a cover on it if you want to hold on, I can go get it in the next room. Sure. But I don't know if yeah, you want to. Yeah. You want me to? Okay, hold yeah. on. <laughs> Good. Guys, she took the headphones off. We can say all sorts of bad things yeah. about her. Perfect. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm big thanks kidding. to Alex for putting this episode, to helping us put this chat together. It's been, been a blast. Yeah, really good. Absolutely. Yeah. Man, you guys are terrific. I love you guys. Yeah, I, I think this too. is one of like the first fucking time ever that our video has gone off. It looks like without a hitch over there. I haven't seen Brody swearing. Oh. Oh, second time. Second time. Okay. Yeah. So we're getting better with the video. It's, it's gone good. So that's really good. It's and the great. audio has been good tonight too, actually. Yeah. Um, oh, everything sounds good. great. All right. You let's... want me to just, this is the, yeah. uh, this is the hardcover that came out in a year ago. Oh, perfect. And this is the paperback that they did a whole new cover for it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Beauty. So there they are. And they've got a lot of pictures in them. Right on. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you on again uh, in a couple months and just spend the whole time talking about that one. Okay. I, then it's that'd a little more in oh, less over my head. I think that'd be fun. He, you're, There's a Darren's, lot of information. Yeah, Darren's really interested in the ch in the children uh, past lives. Yeah, I the mean, children's had... past lives stuff really, really. So I've had some experiences with my kids, and yeah, we oh, should really? do that. Wow. Yeah, we should do that down the road for sure. That would be great. And you know, Jim Tucker is the uh, is the expert on that too. From uh, I mean, I've I'm been not an expert like trying to get is. him on, but he's tough. He said, yeah. he said no, flat out. <laughs> I said no, really? Yeah, but maybe now that we've had Leslie on, that'll, he'll change his tune. Well, yeah. you've interviewed him, haven't you, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. think. I don't think he said no. I think he said check back. I should actually check it. I should yeah. actually fucking clarify that. Yeah. I don't think he said no. I think he said he was busy and <laughs> check back and like. Yeah. It's probably busy. Yeah. yeah. Probably we did have, uh, who did we have on that talked about it a little bit? Uh, I forget now. I can't remember, but yeah, we've that's something we've been wanting to explore more. I mean, consciousness always comes up; it overlaps with all the stuff we talk about. So yeah, yeah. I mean, but the two cases that I profile in the book are are really incredible, and yeah. I could be happy to talk about them. There probably it's such an irony that I think they're the best cases we have, and they're both American cases. Huh. Whereas you know all the work that Ian Stevenson did for decades was mainly with cases you know in India and Burma and Sri Lanka and places like that, but then there are these incredible cases, and they were both recent too. Huh. Tom Schroeder. Where they they're just extraordinary. Yeah. So that book by Tom Schroeder was great. Yeah, that's. But these cases, on, yeah. it's born in the one of them was born in the nineties, the other one was born in I think two thousand or something. So they're they're really really interesting cases. With so lots of information. How how was your book accepted in the and did you get any negative feedback from the materialists that type of thing or did you did you no, no I mean I haven't you know I haven't been in really in a position to deal with them so mm. I don't think they're gonna like read it and then write me letters no or I don't I don't think do so that. they ignore I think honestly they just ignore all this stuff especially the stuff that has all the scientific type evidence yeah in it, the harder stuff it's they're just I don't know I don't think they. They care. I mean, Alex, I mean Sean Alex Carroll always, is the guy. He's yeah. the one that really, that I would love to just, I don't know. I wrote this article. I sent it to you, didn't I, Alex? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I, I, I thought about sending it to Sean Carroll, but then I thought, I don't know. What's the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He must have heard it all before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But he's just, right. it's so bizarre to me when they will say that something doesn't exist that exists. It's yeah. like saying the sky isn't blue. Yeah. It's you changing. Know? It's changing. 
The chemtrails get in the way, and then it's not blue. (laughs) That's true. All right, guys. Well, yeah, we don't want to keep you on too long, Leslie. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Yeah, big thanks for coming on the show, Leslie. Okay, good to be with you guys. Leslie, thanks so much for allowing us to, you know, hammer over all that UFO stuff. We really appreciate you being a sport. Really appreciate it. I'm not claiming that I know everything either. So She's tough, tough as nails. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, continue the awesome work. I mean, things are really, they are changing, and it's, it's great to talk to you about it. Okay, hey, good. I kind of knew it. You know, someone, as Leslie's uh, attested, I mean, if, if you're tough enough to push that story through the New York Times, then you're tough enough to take some, some a little bit of grilling. So that's yeah. really That's cool. okay. I don't yeah. mind it at all. I just don't feel like I'm very, it's very satisfying for you probably to talk no, to no, me. No, no, it's but... good. No, it's great. <laughs> no, no, no. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was really something to get this into the New York Times. That was no easy, easy job, believe me. Yeah. So. That and we would have said a lot more than we in the story, you know, if we could have. Yeah. More about the yeah. phenomenon itself and yeah. you know, yeah. that kind of thing. They were just super cautious. Yeah. As you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we hopefully that. the next story will be even more interesting than the first one. Right on. All right. Well, we're looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, big thanks, thanks to Alex. Alex. Thanks big Leslie. thanks to Leslie. Okay. You guys come back anytime. And thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay. Ciao. And Alex, thanks for all your great stuff. I, oh. I listen to your interviews a lot. And they're incredibly wonderful. You're way, way kind. Thank you. I mean it. Not He's being one of the kind. best. Check out Skeptical Bar. if you haven't already. Not yeah. You, you really, you really do great stuff. I value it. Thank Ciao, you guys. See you. Okay, yeah. guys. Bye, bye for now. Bye. And that was our chat with uh, Leslie and Alex. It was a fun one. A little. A little heated, not too bad. Oh, did you heat it? You hung up rails. on Alex there? Yeah, we can call I him back. I thought he might join us for the outro. We can call him. Oh, yeah, I could have too late now. Yeah. We'll Don't stop talking. Call Just keep now. going. Keep talking. Don't lose you. <laughs> call him right now. What'd you think? Uh, I think her reasoning is is sound. I mean, honestly, it's a pretty good pretty good excuse. But I, what I was thinking during it is maybe this is the... Uh, there keep he is. talking. Yeah, fuck. maybe this is the... The uh, the organization that's allowed the public view and there's, you know, in, in order to distract from the real investigation that's going on. That's kind of what I, I was sensing during that, because she does have she does have that reasoning of it, the classification thing. But like Alex said, um, I hope you're there, Alex. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah, no, I am. Hey, I'm just going to grab a. a- Drink. I'll be right back. No, no, no. Stay. Stay. No, we're, doing the, we're doing the wrap-up. You can do the outro. It's okay, bud. You've done 290 of these. Don't point at I me. Don't do it. I was sensing that 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 um, that this program is the one that's in the light, and the other stuff is happening in the dark. It's like, we got to feed them something. Now, I don't know why, but I mean, that's totally, you know, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. It's totally conspiratorial. That's just, I'm just... I'm just explaining the feeling that I had because she was, you know, she seems to be, she has all the, she has all the, you know, all the evidence, all the backup. There was this program. Here's the information. Some of it's classified. The only stuff we can show you is the unclassified stuff. Okay. But I think we should check in with Chris. I can agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was great. I think she was a really good sport. Um, Alex was, uh, was great asking his questions. And I mean, I understand I, I'm skeptical of the, I'm skeptical of the political motivation. I mean, why now? You know? To Podesta, yeah. And I'm Podesta skeptical and, of the times too. It's the New York times. It's just fucking. Well, like I was going to say to her is like, well, we're, we're supposed to I trust I to talk to her about that because she knows people there and I'm not going to start running down the times any more than I did. Yeah, but we're not, we're not, we're supposed to believe uh, ex skunk work guys, ex CIA, and the New York Times all of a sudden. I mean, after all the bullshit and the lies that we've been fed over well, the I decades. I don't think we're supposed to. Like she said, it's not for us. Right. Are you, got, you okay over there? You're doing like a little Tourette's thing. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You have to go to the bathroom real bad? No, no, I'm good. So, anyway, we had a great chat here. Of course, Alex pressured her a little bit, a little more than we do. So, that's, it was nice to have Alex here for that. And uh, we can't hear him. Try that again. Are we, we still broadcasting any of this? this yeah, is we're just doing the outro right now. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay. You ruined it. No, it's okay. No, no, it's good. Um, so yeah, guys, do fucking go over to grimeamerica.ca slash support and sign up for a monthly, a weekly, yearly, sign up for something today so we can keep doing and having these chats without any New York Times spin. 
And uh, yeah, you guys can pay the bills instead of the CIA. Zero and then you can ads. always mostly trust us. We don't have to do any ads. And we know you guys are liking the show and you're downloading it and you're listening to it. So, hey, buck a month, two bucks a month, five bucks a month, sign up for something. And if, if you can't afford it, check out the the honey doobie doo list that Graham's got in there and do all that in shit. Show notes. Review it, yeah. review it, share it. You got to share it because we can't share it any more than we do. And I'm sick of going on Twitter. So share it. Anything else? That's it. You got yeah. anything you want to just, say before we wrap up, Alex? No, just great. Th- thanks so much for having me on and covering this topic. You guys did it in the in the classic Grimerica way. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. And thanks to everybody live before we forget to say goodbye to them. And if there was people there uh, listening. I think there was a few. Listening and watching. Yeah. Bro, you let us know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, right on. Thanks for listening, guys. And we will see you next week. Sweet, sweet flowery dress girl. She took a trip out west. Kissed the family and friends goodbye. Went over to the pill and pop. Picked up some postcards. But don't go. It's a cruel world where you're searching for money and fortune and fame. Sweet, sweet flowery dress girl. She took a trip out west. Kissed the family and friends goodbye. Went over to the pill and pop. Picked up some postcards. Don't go It's a cruel world We're searching for money and fortune and fame I was buying postcards today At a store that was playing James Dean That's any music that sounds even a little like Jens Lakeman or Orkerville I walked up the hills today Drank coffee And used the word coin to describe things I'll call you soon Love Diana Dress girl. She took a trip out west. Kissed the family and friends goodbye. Went over to the pill and pump. Picked up some postcards. But don't go. It's a cruel world when you're searching for money and fortune and fame. I stayed here once. My favorite shape is a triangle. My favorite food is a pizza. My favorite smell is waffle cones. My favorite Halloween costume was the scarecrow. But I had to wear my coat over, which I hated. My favorite tea is royals. And flower is the tulip. Right back with your favorites. This is you. And when flower is the tulip, right back with your favorites. This is you. Dress girl. She took a trip out west. Kiss the family and friends goodbye. Run over the hills and hunt. Pick up some postcards. Just don't go. It's a cruel world when you're searching for money and fortune and fame.